Witness mic, witness mic, one, two, three, test, 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 test. Sounds like it's, it's not working. Test. Look at mine, see if I have a jump. Test, 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 test. Do I have a jump bounce? That's test, test, test. Test, 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 member mic, member mic. Test, test, test. It sounds like it's on, but it's not going through the... Might have mute. Test, test, test. One, two, three, four, five. Test, 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 witness mic, witness mic, test. Look over and see, am I getting a bounce? Test, 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 witness mic, witness mic, test, test, test. <laughs> test, 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 witness mic, witness mic, test, test, test. <laughs> Test, test, test. Test, 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 one, two, three, test, test. <laughs>
Test, test, test. Test one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Test, test, one, two. Okay. Member test, member test, member test, test, test. Test, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six. Test, test, test.
good. Subcommittee of Aviation will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that the chair be authorized to declare recess at any time uh, during today's hearing without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that the members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, if members wish to insert a document to the record, please also email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. I'll now recognize myself for the purpose of an opening statement for five minutes. We, we've seen some pretty challenging times in aviation sector over the past several years with COVID, with uh, a huge drop in, in airline travel, then a huge surge back. We've seen air traffic control run into incredible problems. And at the end of the day, it's, it's our job to, to be looking at the impact on consumers, looking at the impact of the, the, the people that are the end users. And there's so many different components in this system. And I think that we're sort of the common thread that are supposed to be looking at this and how we ensure that there's compatibility, that they complement one another. When you look forward and you, you begin looking at the projections for, for pilots, for mechanics, for advanced aviation systems, you look at flight attendants, you look at TSA agents or security personnel, and you look at where we are, we're, we're, we're going off a cliff. And, and what I mean by that is that the challenges that we've seen in recent years, just with air traffic control issues and other challenges and the, and the huge surge and drop in, in airline travel, that, that that will actually become common, common practice, meaning the, the disruptions, the lack of capacity, the higher prices, and, and the, the, the delays and cancellations if we're unable to meet the projected demand. And so this hearing today is, is focused on um, how in this upcoming FAA reauthorization bill, we're, we are going to address workforce issues, uh, an absolutely critical issue. This is the last hearing, I think the fourth hearing that we've had on, on aviation. Um, and I think it's appropriate that today um, that we close out by talking about the hardworking men and women um, that are, that are uh, the backbone of our, of our aviation industry. Um, I want to thank the, the, the full committee chairman, uh, Sam Graves, for working with us and helping to identify the hearing topics that we've gone through. I want to thank my, my friend, Mr. Cohen, the ranking member, and Mr. Larson, uh, for their leadership issues and for their input on this as well to make sure that we're thinking about the big themes and, and thinking about the proper topics for the reauthorization bill. Um, if, if, I, if I look at the, at the uh, kind of the, the last few weeks or months of, of, of hearings that we've had, there's no question that we're, we're at a crossroads in, in civil aviation. Um, but I also want to say that the aviation industry, I think, is, is really is remarkable. Uh, despite all the, the flaws and problems, and sometimes in spite of the solutions that Congress imposes, um, sometimes in search of problems, um, uh, we still have the, the safest, the busiest, and the most successful uh, aviation system in the world. And um, all of the successes is owed to the nation's unmatched aviation workforce. And I want to thank, again, the men and women, that, the millions of men and women that make up that, that aerospace workforce. Um, look, as we, as we move forward, um, I, I, I think it's critical that we get input from the different sectors that are here today. And I'll go through and, and say it again, whether, whether you're here representing pilots, you're representing airlines, you're representing general aviation, you're representing flight attendants, you're representing the mechanics, you're representing all the ground crews that are out there, you're representing this next generation, this advanced aviation that we're looking at. Um, we've got to get this right. Um, because at the end of the day, if we don't, then the disruptions that we've seen over the last few years, quite frankly, aren't going to be anything. Um, and so I, um, I, I think it's critical as we move forward um, that we look carefully at the weakest link. We've often found ourselves out there building up one component of it only to not have another. And for example, look at what's happened recently with the constraining of capacity in the Northeast. Uh, we had a weak link. We had lack of capacity in one single sector of the aviation industry, we've had to actually pull back slots or constrain capacity. And starting out, or coming back to what I said starting out, at the end of the day, this is about the consumer. And if we're constraining capacity, we're reducing convenience, and we're probably increasing prices. And um, that's not the direction we need to be moving in. So in closing, I'm going to say this. Um, we are well aware there are projections that make it crystal clear that we've got challenges ahead of us. And we've got to be thinking about how we can move forward in a way 
that meets the growing demand that we're going to have, but does it while maintaining the clear objective of convenience, of affordability, of safety, of safety, and making sure that we do this in a way that's smart and effective for taxpayers. So with that, um, I, uh, I yield back my time and I recognize uh, Ranking Member Cohen for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome everybody. And I particularly want to say I'm aware of the so this is Colgan family that's here and that you continue to represent your, your loved ones who were lost in that terrible, horrific crash and that you're here to see that we have safe and, and good transportation. Um, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and Pinnacle Airlines, which was then Colgan, was out of my city, and uh, I regret that, and they, they didn't run their airline necessarily as well as they should have. They ran it on the cheap. So I apologize. I look forward to hearing from our esteemed witnesses today as we seek to learn about how we can develop and diversify the U.S. aviation workforce. The aviation industry is approaching a critical juncture with respect to its talent development, especially the recruitment, training, and retention of individuals in its workforce. Significant post-pandemic increase, everybody wants to travel, uh, and an aging workforce are just two elements that have exaggerated the need for uh, the FAA, Congress, and the industry leadership to be vigilant in workforce development efforts. Without that, we can't have the airlines as they should be. Partly due to recent staffing issues, the traveling public has had to deal with notable disruptions in air transportation over the past 24 months, uh, with increases in airline, commercial airline delays and cancellations, leaving millions stranded at airports. Um, I just experienced that Sunday when my plane was canceled. Uh, Alex, have we found out why yet? Not yet. We've been trying. They said it was weather, but nobody else knows anything about the weather that would have done that, so I was stranded. Uh, last year, 20% of flights arrived behind schedule, resulting in 1.3 million delayed flights. There were roughly 181,000 canceled flights in 2022, exceeding 2021. These statistics suggest Congress must move with an urgency to potentially developing the workforce and ensure U.S. air travel could continue to meet the demands of our public. And to ensure our safety rem rem remains the gold standard, we must shift the focus to cultivating new pipelines for upcoming aviation professionals to flow through. One obvious solution resides within collegiate aviation programs, which help students transition from college to career on the flight deck in airports and in repair shops. In 2022, the Tennessee Board of Regents approved a new program at Southwest Tennessee Community College in my district, which will help folks get into the airline industry. And with Feller Express in Memphis, we have those jobs available. Aims to keep those students in the, in the aviation industry or to help them get into it, first two-year program of its kind in Tennessee and is poised to help diversify the aviation workforce. There's been progress in the FAA's historical HBCU initiative program and several commercial operators such as Delta have pathway programs aimed at diversifying their workforce. Another great example in my district is FedEx, which just celebrated its 50th birthday. Uh, a birthday that when, it's, when they came 50 years ago, it was transformative to the passage delivery in the world. And to Memphis, it was a, a lifeline and a seamless relationship that continues and should continue forever. Um, they have uh, contributed to with working with HBCUs to break down entry barriers for black students, which is a large portion of our community in Memphis. They've created and funded three programs since 2021, which aims to empower and educate HBCU students while also connecting them to internships and mentorship programs within the FedEx network. While these programs are helping to make progress, minority demographics are still severely underrepresented in commercial aviation. Black Americans consist, uh, constitute only 3.4% of professional pilots, 5.6% of airport management positions, and 9.5% of air traffic controllers, whereas women comprise only 20% of the aviation workforce. To rectify this issue, strengthen the workforce, and protect the industry's longevity, the concepts of diversity, equity, access, and inclusion must be at the front, uh, forefront of our endeavors. I applaud the FAA, Congress, and the aviation stakeholders for their efforts thus far in helping move the needle in the right direction to develop the U.S. aerospace workforce. However, as we will hear from our witnesses present today, there's still more work to be done to ensure our workforce continues to grow. I look forward to learning more about how our subcommittee can support this multifaceted development so equity and inclusion, inclusion can become concepts embedded in all of aviation, making recruitment retention challenges an issue of the past. I come to this position with... Uh, uh, great joy and, and, and in my work, an opportunity to do more good as being ch chairman of this subcommittee. But it's a difficult journey for me because there might be a time or two I have to vote against 
my chair because he's, and he's such a nice guy and he's such a good human being that it's going to make it real hard for me. But I'm going to do the best I can. I yield back the balance of my time. You can always just go for a walk. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I now recognize the chair of the chair of the full committee, um, uh, Sam Graves, and, and and somebody who's been a great aviation mentor for me, and and I think knows uh, knows more about aviation than anyone in this room. Uh, recognize the chair for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our witnesses all for uh, for being here today. And I do want to commend um, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Cohen. Uh, for holding these hearings in advance of the upcoming uh, FAA reauthorization. Um, I think it's very fitting that we kick off our series, first series of, uh, of hearings that we've had uh, with safety because it underpins our entire aviation system. And, you know, we are concluding today by focusing on the aerospace um, workforce. So the men and women who keep the cogs turning in factories and, and repair facilities and cockpits and air traffic control towers across the country are not only instrumental to ensuring the safety of the traveling public, but they're also ensuring the global competitiveness of the American aerospace system. And now is the time to examine the challenges the aviation industry faces as we build and fly the advanced aircraft of the future. As a pilot, as a professional pilot, I think about how pilot training has remained static over the years, except for the adoption of the 1,500-hour uh, rule. We've heard at our first hearing how we've established the gold standard in aviation here in uh, the United States, but it's also true that many other countries have safe systems. And none of them have achieved their record by matching the 1,500-hour rule uh, for the first officer, um, including the United States. So, in our system, pilots with around 250 hours, they typically are, are very structured hours. They come out of flight school and they're left to bridge that gap um, to 1,500 hours. And only a few of those hours have any kind of uh, uh, requirements associated with them. Um, and they can almost always be logged on a clear, sunny day. And I'm not convinced that kids coming out of flight school and telling them they need to be towing banners or, or teaching students or boring holes in the sky while racking up debt produces um, the best pilots. We all know what the FAA found, and that is the number of flight hours you have are not a reflection of what kind of a pilot you are. And I know some of our pilot groups out there like to point out that we haven't had an accident in the last, uh, in the last 10 years. So I went back through and examined those accidents because they point to the fact that, that uh, they are as a result of the 1500 flight rule, or our flight rule. So if you go back and look at the accidents prior to 2010, not one single one had anything to do with the 1,500 hours. You can classify accidents in two categories. You can classify them as mechanical failure, which the FAA determines is unrecoverable due to something happening to the aircraft. Or you can classify them as pilot error. So if you go back in 2004, Pinnacle, what we saw was a severe lack of professionalism where the pilot in command had 7,000 hours and he pushed the envelope during a ferry flight and he did that intentionally, um, having fun, and it led to a loss of both engines. In 2004, a corporate airlines pilot failed to properly execute a non-precision approach. Both crew members had in excess of 1,500 hours. Com Air in 2006, Pilots attempted to take off from the wrong runway. Both crew members had well in excess of 1,500 hours. And then we come to Colgan. The captain responded incorrectly to a stall warning that led to the loss of the airplane. Both crew members had well in excess of 1,500 hours. The captain had 3,379 hours, and the first officer had 2,244 hours. It had nothing to do with the 1,500-hour flight rule. <clears throat> We have got to find better ways to train safer and better skilled pilots and give folks the credit for the skill that they demonstrate or the high quality training that they receive. Let's look at the military. You come out of the military and you go into combat 300 hours. So what we're saying is, is that pilots have 300 hours, they're qualified to fly an F-15 for the Air Force or an F-18 for the Navy in combat, but they're not qualified to fly in the right seat of an airliner. They're qualified to fly in a C-17 or a C-130 hauling heavy cargo, but they're not qualified to fly in the right seat of an airliner. We all know what happened in Buffalo. 
And I agree that the system covered up some problems. That's where we need to focus. We need to focus on what the problem is, not what the problem isn't. Anything less is an insult to the professionalism in the industry um, that relies on our pilots, to be quite honest with you. And with that, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses about the ways that we can improve not only the pilot workforce, but other skilled professionals um, our pilots depend on to make sure that we deliver the people and the goods um, all over the country. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your opening remarks. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Larson, for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for calling today's uh, <clears throat> FAA reauthorization hearing to explore the challenges facing the workforce in aviation and aerospace. American innovation and economic growth and global leadership are impossible without the hardworking Americans that make up our nation's aerospace and aviation workforce. These dedicated and talented individuals keep our skies safe and efficient, design, build, repair, and operate our most modern aircraft, and help ensure the traveling public arrives at their final destinations without incident, Representative Cohen's experience notwithstanding. The last few years have exacerbated ongoing challenges facing the industry and workforce. Congress has a responsibility to address these challenges to ensure that we retain a robust U.S. aerospace and aviation workforce now and in the future. Recent projections show air travel is expected to reach pre-pandemic levels in North America by the end of this year. And that growth is welcomed, but the industry has struggled to keep pace with this robust recovery that, thanks to decisive congressional action to sustain the industry during the pandemic, occurred much faster than anticipated. Often at the forefront of this discussion is the availability and recruitment of U.S. commercial airline pilots. While there continues to be debate about where, whether the current or future supply of pilots is enough to adequately meet demand, here are some facts. The FAA has reportedly issued an average of more than 6,200 new airline transport pilot or ATP and restricted uh, ATP or ATP certificates every year since 2014. From 2017 to 2022, the number of new ATP uh, certificates issued annually more than doubled from an estimated 4,500 to 9,600 certificates. And the Bureau of Labor Stats, or BLS, projects the overall employment of airline and commercial pilots to grow 6% from uh, 2021 to 2031. Meanwhile, the U.S. maintains its role as a global leader in aviation safety, in part due to the key safety rule requiring 1,500 hours of total flight time for pilots hired by U.S. airlines. As many of us know, the standard was, the standard was enacted following the Colgan Air Flight 3407 crash near Buffalo in 2009. And I, too, would like to recognize the families who are here today who lost loved ones and thank them for their unwavering and consistent advocacy in, in front of this committee and in front, of the, um, in front of Congress. Since the establishment of this rule, the U.S. commercial airline industry has experienced one of the safest decades on record. And while the advancement of aviation technologies such as full-scale flight simulators and other computer-based equipment are helpful tools in developing a more skilled and safer pilot workforce, there is no substitute for real-world flying experience on a flight deck. So preserving the current safety requirements on training are critical to maintaining U.S. gold standard in aviation safety. Further, Congress and the, uh, the FAA and stakeholders must expand the pipeline and, of talent and improve efforts to recruit train and retain a robust workforce from every part of our society. To address this priority, the 2018 FAA bill invested $10 million annually in the Section 625 Aviation Workforce Development Grant programs to support the training and recruitment of new aircraft mechanics and pilots. For example, in my hometown of Everett, Washington, Aviation Technical Services, or ATS, earned a $459,000 grant to support their apprenticeship and training programs which focus on introductory and displaced workers as well as veterans transitioning to civilian life. This grant program is widely supported by stakeholders. Unfortunately, despite receiving hundreds of applications, the FAA could only award 53 grants in the last two funding rounds. So increasing the overall funding level for this program would also help alleviate the bottleneck in training. And finally, as our nation works towards a long-term recovery, uh, it is critical the educational and career opportunities in the aerospace industry be available and accessible to all uh, Americans. According to the latest census data, women represent more than half of the U.S. population, 50.8%, yet only 3.6% of airline captains and 2.6% of aircraft mechanics. Further, more than 13% of the U.S. population 
is African American. However, only 3.4% of commercial air pilots are African American. Uh, my point here is that there is an opportunity, the opportunity for the aviation and aerospace industry, not just to take the initial steps to enhance and diversify its workforce uh, through the creation of flight training academies, apprenticeships, and other career programs, it's that more can be done. And Congress must expand the pipeline of people entering aviation careers by increasing outreach to and opportunities for communities underrepresented in the industry because it's not just the right thing to do, it's probably the most economic, uh, economically uh, competitive thing that we can do to maintain the long-term health of the industry. And so I would um, I look forward to the, the um, uh, testimony today from our panel, and with that, I um, yield back my negative two seconds. Almost on time, Mr. Larson. I would like to welcome our witnesses today and thank them for being here. Briefly, I'd like to take a moment to explain how our lighting system works. There are three lights in front of you. Green means go, yellow means you're running out of time, so wrap it up, and red means your time has expired. I ask unanimous consent that the witness's full statements be included in the record without objection, so ordered. As your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee asks that you limit your oral remarks to five minutes. And with that, uh, Ms. Black, you are recognized for five minutes of your opening testimony. Thank you very much. Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Cohen, Subcommittee Members, I'm Faye Malarkey Black, CEO of the Regional Airline Association. Thank you for including me. Every airline worker holds the safety of passengers in their hands. My full statement covers more ground, so I'll focus now on the pilot shortage, which has grown for years. While our industry contracted, small communities lost air service, and other airline employees lost jobs. Thank you for the payroll support program. It saved our industry. Still, we emerged smaller from the pandemic. Regional airlines did not shed pilots, but larger airlines saw 6,000 leave. Their replacements, plus more from gro for growth, came from regionals. Regionals turned to a pipeline that was higher than usual last year, but still qualified just 9,491, while 12 large airlines alone hired 13,128. Today, 300 airports have lost air service, losing on average one in four flights. 11 airports went dark. Some say these were profit decisions, so let's settle the matter. Airlines do not shrink networks to profitability, nor park expensive assets unless they must. Today, we see stabilization, not recovery. And within 15 years, nearly half of all pilots will retire. Networks use larger aircraft to cope, concentrating service at larger cities while cutting frequency in markets. Passengers become drivers while traffic fatalities claimed more than 40,000 lives last year. Some have used data stripped of context to say the pilot shortage is not real. Some say a large moat around the career is needed to boost wages for those inside. Some say there is no pilot shortage, just a pay shortage. Regional airlines starting pay averages $100,000 for pilots. Bonuses can exceed $125,000. 500 jets are parked. Pay hasn't solved this. We need better career access. Today's federal student aid system fails pilots. Federal loans are short $80,000 or more. Airlines provide subsidized training and other supports, but lower income families can't bridge the gap. Today's pilots are 96% white and 91% male. A racial wealth gap means cost barriers hurt people of color most. Many find work first jobs to afford pilot jobs. The average new hire is in their 30s, the median age for childbearing. RA supports a bill expected soon to align student loans with flight education costs. This can't come soon enough. We support use of 529 plans for flight training in the GI Bill for private pilot licenses. Pilots are high earners. Helping people fund training is the right thing to do in its sound economic policy. As solutions advance, we ask Congress to let experienced pilots fly until age 67 if they choose. Raising the age will have immediate positive effects, particularly as an acute captain shortage slows even first officers. No data shows a pilot is unsafe at 65, but this arbitrary line forces qualified pilots to retire when they have much to offer. These are mentors for the next generation, and they have our support. Most importantly, RA urges Congress to ensure pilot qualification standards ensure qualified pilots. A rule change in 2013 required pilots to gain vastly more pre-hire flight time 
without support for pilots shouldering the burden. This was intended to improve pilot experience, but the reality has been different. The same studies FAA used to craft the rule have been updated four times, and each shows that pilots now build time at the expense of the quality and the recency of their training. The more time pilots spend building hours, the more the positive effect of their training fades. Despite the rhetoric, pilots do not encounter icing or thunderstorms or practice commercial flying procedures when they build this time. They fly light aircraft in clear weather. They arrive in our training programs with high time, but they are not ready. Failure rates have soared, even though airlines have, have tightened screening and expanded training footprints repeatedly. Over-reliance on hours has introduced risk, and we are compensating with remedial training. We have not asked to change the rule. Congress has already provided the remedy, directing FAA to approve training pathways that enhance safety. But just three exist with no action since 2013. The operating environment has changed, and flight simulators and training devices have advanced. No airline would assume a 2013 training program remains relevant today, and the FAA should not either. FAA must keep up, and we ask Congress to keep watch. There's never been a better time to be a commercial airline pilot, but we need safe policies to open doors to this transformational career. We will keep doing our part. We'd like your help. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Black. Dr. DeVito, you are recognized for five minutes of your opening testimony. DeVito. It's DeVivo, but that's DeVivo. okay. DeVivo, my apologies. <laughs> Members of the Subcommittee on Aviation, thank you so much for allowing me to speak to this esteemed group. I'm honored to be part of this panel of engaged leaders who are working to provide opportunities to the next generation workforce. I come here today to offer two perspectives. The first is as the chair of the Youth Access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force, a group of 21 members charged by Congress to look at how we provide a growing workforce pipeline to the aviation and aerospace industry. We developed 21 recommendations to address this challenge. The second perspective is as the president of Vaughn College of Aeronautics and Technology, a private nonprofit institution in New York City. We offer certifications and degree programs in aviation. The task force provided a roadmap for implementation with a set of actionable items using documented best practices and initiatives designed to grow the workforce. The overwhelming evidence to our talent shortfall lies in young people from currently underrepresented groups who are unaware of the jobs available in this sector and the transformational opportunities they represent. This industry has been an unknown opportunity for these communities, including rural communities. Building awareness needs to begin at age 10 when students are exploring their passions and their interests are formed. Key to this effort is creating a one-stop shop website this resource for student and families would provide information and support to join the industry. 18 is the second critical time when students and families are making training and education decisions and the pathway needs to be clearly defined and communicated. The next hurdle is funding. <clears throat> we must also make the pathway affordable so that students from every economic background can pursue the needed credentials to join the workforce. Among the recommendations, decrease the cost of flight training by increasing the allowable simulator time for pilot certification, increasing the maximum Pell Grant for students, developing a national aviation scholarship program, increasing donations to aerospace education programs, increasing the current FAA workforce grant program from 10 million to 50 million, as well as increasing funds to support the FAA's oversight of that program, and leveraging their regulatory oversight to lower costs by updating its personnel and certification standards. The connective tissue that links these recommendations together is the need to communicate at the regional and national level. We suggest a model based on the nine regions of the FAA. The regional aviation, regional advisory councils would collaborate on pathways, best practices, and resources with a representative from each regional council forming a national advisory council that would monitor efforts and design metrics for success. These councils could be managed and coordinated by the FAA's Aviation and Space Education Office. We further encourage the FAA to seek out partnerships with the Department of Labor, the Department of Education, and others to facilitate communication and alignment of national priorities that shape, shape training and certification pathways. As an ed educational institution that serves a primarily underserved and underrepresented population, 
Vaughn College understands firsthand the challenges that students from under-resourced communities face. We serve a population of about 1,200, 80% are from underrepresented backgrounds, and most are first generation. The average family income for an aviation, a Vaughn Aviation Maintenance student is about 34,000, and for all other programs, about 42,000. An aviation maintenance student has a 55% gap between the cost of tuition and federal and state financial aid, and 48% gap for all others. For our flight students, the cost of training is an additional 75 to 85,000. Many families do not qualify for a Parent PLUS loan and turn to the alternative loan market where the interest rates are high. Doubling Pell would provide greater financial support. Congress could also consider the Flight Education Access Act to increase the subsidized and unsubsidized loan limits. Families could carry the debt with a competitive interest rate, and an income-based repayment option would allow affordable repayment. Congress could also do more to support minority-serving institutions with grants for simulation equipment, curriculum development, and faculty, like the options available through the Department of Education with Title V and Title III grants. This effort could be coordinated with a cooperative relationship between the FAA and DOE. The future will only become more challenging with advanced air mobility and uncrewed aerial vehicles. The current workforce demands do not factor in the technicians, pilots, vertiport managers, and engineers needed for these burgeoning fields. The FAA needs the staffing and operational support to meet these demands. We have the roadmap. Now we need commitment to invest in building a pipeline that supplies the workforce for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. DeVivo. Hopefully I got it right that time. Mr. Thress, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Vice Chairman Yakum. Uh, Ranking Member Cohen, Ranking Member Larson, members of the subcommittee, on behalf of Flight Safety International, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Brad Thress, President and CEO of Flight Safety. Uh, I'd like to start by saying as a lifelong aviator and a former Air Force pilot, uh, type rated in several commercial and business jet aircraft, I'm very passionate about the safety of our industry and uh, it's the focus of our entire company. Uh, flight safety trains pilots, maintenance technicians, cabin personnel, dispatchers and drone operators for business aviation, defense and the commercial airlines. We also engineer and manufacture our own simulators at our factory in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Simulator flight training is an integral part of the safety improvements achieved by the aviation industry over the last several decades. It has proven to save lives. It is a regulatory requirement around the world, and it is also required by insurers of complex airplanes. Globally, over 1,500 civil full flight simulators are in operation. Sims are certified to accurately recreate the experience of flight operations. They provide a fully immersive experience Pilots are qualified in U-types 100% in the simulator. The first time they fly the airplane is typically with passengers in the back. The full flight uh, sim you see pictured here on the left consists of three major assemblies, an exact duplicate of a full cockpit, which you can see in the upper right picture, a high definition wraparound visual system, and a motion base. The average cost of a full flight sim is $12 million, and they simulate operations anywhere in the world in all weather conditions. Simulators also enable flight crews to experience all possible aircraft malfunctions, many of which are impractical to train in the aircraft because it's unsafe. Between 2020 and 2022, 488 accidents occurred during training flights. That's 11% of all accidents. These accidents resulted in 70 fatalities. Simulators also allow crews to experience rare events like ra rapid decompressions and emergency descents, high speed rejected takeoffs and dual engine failures. Full spectrum of operating environments are also available in the simulator. We train environmental events like wingtip vortices encounters, wind shear, cold weather operations in snow and ice, and mountainous airport operations in poor weather. We also train special operating procedures like the approaches into Washington Reagan. Just as a flight hour of combat training in an F-35 differs dramatically from an hour in a 172, an hour of simulator training is far more valuable than an hour in a single engine aircraft. The two pictures on the right contrast the experience of the simulator on the upper right and the single engine airplane on the lower right. 
Since 2013, airline co-pilots are required to have 1,500 hours, just like airline captains. It is very expensive to build this time, which drives many of these hours into single engine aircraft, where the experience is not relevant to commercial operations. Simulator training duplicates the full commercial operating environment. The impact of the simulator experience could be expanded by increasing the credit allowed toward the 1,500 hours. Currently, a maximum of 100 hours of sim time are allowed, which is just 7% of the requirement. Increasing this to a more significant portion would enhance the preparedness of the pilot workforce. I'll conclude by saying flight simulators are proven technologies. They're here today. The industry relies on them. Increasing their use will give pilots a much stronger and relevant body of experience and enhance the safety of the aviation industry. I'll yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Thress. Ms. Krause, you are recognized for five minutes. Vice Chair Yoakum, Ranking Member Cohen, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss GAO's work on the aviation workforce. Like many other critical sectors of the nation's economy, the aviation industry has been adversely affected by the COVID pandemic. However, demand has steadily rebounded since spring of 2021, with ICAO predicting global traffic levels to exceed pre-pandemic levels this year. We have previously reported on industry concerns that new workers, particularly commercial airline pilots and aircraft mechanics, were not entering the industry at a pace sufficient to replace attrition and support the industry's projected growth. With the recent rebound in traffic, these concerns have reemerged. My statement today is based on our past work and forthcoming report on the aviation workforce, and will focus on, one, what federal and industry data reveal about the supply and demand of airline pilots and aircraft mechanics, two, challenges to maintaining or growing workforce supply, and three, actions the aviation industry and FAA are taking to address those challenges. First, federal data, federal and industry data on the supply of U.S. pilots reveal a growing but also aging workforce. From 2017 through 2022, the total number of individuals qualified to be airline pilots, that is those holding airline transport pilot or ATP and active medical certificates, increased by 3% or 3,000 or by 2%. The number of students enrolled in four-year pilot training schools also doubled from around 15,000 in 2017 to around 30,000 in 2021. However, as of 2022, over half of active ATP certificate holders were over the age of 50. While the supply has increased, the combination of increases in pilot hiring, wages, and employment in recent years also show strong demand and can serve as indicators of a tight labor market. Demand for pilots is especially acute among regional airlines, reporting that their operations have been affected by difficulties in hiring and retaining pilots, particularly captains who have moved to larger airlines. As for aircraft mechanics, mechanic certificates grew by 11% and student enrollment grew by 18% from 2017 to 2022. However, there was a decline in employment levels and an increase in wages, which may suggest that the number of mechanics willing or able to work in aviation has decreased. There are some limitations to what data can tell us about this workforce. For example, because some certificated pilots and mechanics may be working for other industries or aerospace companies, the ATP and mechanic certificate data overestimate the number of currently, em currently employed by airlines or repair stations. In addition, future supply and demand projections are inherently uncertain. For example, the projected growth assumes continued economic growth. If a recession or another unexpected event affecting demand were to occur, the projections may be higher than actual demand. A number of challenges continue to constrain the supply of pilots and mechanics, according to aviation stakeholders we interviewed for our forthcoming report. Several of these challenges we have reported on before and include, one, the high cost of pilot education, two, pay and working conditions faced by mechanics whose skills are highly valued by other industries, and three, limited workforce diversity, which shrinks the pool of potential future applicants. Airlines, repair stations, and FAA are taking steps to address these challenges. For example, several regional airlines recently increased pilot pay, in one case boosting starting wages for first-year first-class officers and captains by around 120% and 175% respectively. In addition, some airlines and repair stations have established their own training schools and programs to help train pilots and mechanics. FAA also has several efforts to enhance outreach and attract more youth and diversity to aviation careers. 
For example, under the Aviation Workforce Grant Programs established by Congress in FAA's last reauthorization, FAA awarded $5 million to 16 schools for pilots and another $5 million to 15 schools for maintenance workers in 2022. However, FAA received more than 300 applications for these grants. And several stakeholders we interviewed said the funding provided is likely not enough to make a substantial impact on supply challenges. In closing, a sufficient supply of skilled aviation workers is critical to ensuring a safe and robust aviation system. The recent strong recovery of aviation demand has been good for the industry, but has also exacerbated longstanding workforce challenges. Meeting aviation workforce needs is a shared responsibility among the aviation industry, schools, and government. This concludes my statement. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Ms. Kraus. Captain Ambrosi, you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Chair Graves, Ranking Member Larson, Chair Graves, Ranking Member Cohen, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to offer my view on behalf of more than 67,000 pilots of the Airline Pilots Association International. I'd like to thank this committee for its bold action in 2020 to pass the payroll support program. It prevented the collapse of the airline industry and saved American jobs. Your work guaranteed that this country would have enough pilots during the pandemic and could respond to demand-driven growth when recovery came. Thanks to you, the United States has more than enough pilots and the safest guys in the world. A decade earlier, this committee also came together in a bipartisan effort to take on a crisis in our industry, a series of fatal accidents, the last of which occurred near Buffalo, New York in 2009. I'm honored that the families of those who lost loved ones on that flight and on the ground are represented here today. In response to more than 1,100 lives lost in U.S. airline accidents in the 20 years prior to 2010, Congress heeded investigators who found that inadequate pilot experience and training had contributed to the crashes. In the 2010 FAA bill, you established stronger pilot qualification, training, and experience requirements and made other aviation safety improvements. Since then, passenger fatalities have dropped by 99.8%. This year's reauthorization should be based on retaining these provisions. This pilot training framework has also produced tens of thousands more pilots over the past decade than airlines needed. The United States has certificated nearly 64,000 airline transport pilots since July of 2013, while airlines have hired to fill approximately 40,000 positions. In this context, airlines' decisions during COVID to bump pilots to smaller equipment park aircraft, as well as furlough and put pilots on an inactive status have created a training backlog. When demand and subsequently growth returned more quickly than some airlines anticipated, most of these pilots had to be retrained. Retraining is time intensive and expensive. It also relies on a training footprint that includes personnel and simulator devices and wasn't designed for a global pandemic. Fortunately, we have more pilots available now than before the pandemic. As a result, the training backlog is already resolving itself as airlines get caught up. Moreover, pilot training classes are at capacity and college aviation programs are full. With the recovery, and thanks to this committee's work, airlines are hiring pilots as companies expand market share and networks. As a result, new workers are performing new roles in air transportation system that's already stressed and working to integrate new and expanding users. This is no time to weaken safety standards. The current labor market is complicated by pilots moving among carriers as they leave airlines that offer less attractive careers for those providing better pay and quality of life. Regional airlines have traditionally offered second tier pay and work rules and some would rather lower safety standards than pay pilots a living wage. This isn't how the United States became the gold standard in aviation safety and it's predictable that pilots would pursue better opportunities. Large passenger and cargo airlines have 7,500 more pilots today than before the pandemic, even when we account for pilots who change jobs multiple times. While encouraging, we shouldn't lose focus on continuing to expand the pilot pipeline. In this year's FAA reauthorization, Congress should build on the strength of America's aviation workforce, maintain safety, and open the doors of opportunity for all of those who aspire to fly by providing student loans for appropriate flight training programs, establish grants to build flight training and education degree programs at minority serving institutions, increasing funding for workforce development grant program 
and making the Women in Aviation Advisory Board a permanent body. At the same time, we need a real dialogue about our nation's commitment to air service to small communities. I flew for a regional airline and am committed to ensuring that small and rural community passengers have access to safe and reliable service. However, under deregulations, airlines base service decisions on market demand. ALPA stands ready to work with this committee to improve the essential air service program. We support increasing the subsidy cap, enabling the regulator and airlines to adjust EAS payments when appropriate, and modifying airlines' frequency requirements. Actions like these, not weakening safety standards, will provide the air service rural communities need. ALPA looks forward to collaborating with this committee to ensure this nation continues to have an abundant supply of airline pilots and lead the world in aviation safety. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Ambrosi. Yesterday, the committee received a letter from former FAA Administrator and former ALPA President Randy Babbitt and former Acting FAA Administrator and Airline Pilot Dan Elwell, encouraging the committee to consider the quality of training hours for pilots on their way to an ATP. I ask unanimous consent that a copy of that letter from the two former FAA leaders be entered in the record. Seeing no objection, so ordered. I now recognize myself for five minutes as we will now be moving into member questioning. Thanks again to our witnesses for being here and to examine, as we examine the challenges facing the aviation workforce. In the last few weeks, I visited the South Bend International Airport in my district, as well as the Lyft Academy for Republic Airways in Indianapolis. And a common theme for both visits was the pilot shortage. South Bend has big plans for new routes to further connect our community to the rest of the world and drive our local economy forward. But the feedback they're getting from the airlines is they're interested as they have specific routes planned that are identified that we discussed in the meeting, but they don't have the pilots to do it. And they can't add the flights until they have crews. And right now they're telling us that they have no crews. So let's be clear. I think United Airlines CEO put it best in a recent earnings call, and I quote, there's a pilot shortage and that is real. And it's going to take years to resolve. Something I wanna focus on this morning is training and the concept of quantity versus quality. The value of the hours spent in a Cessna, as I am, have gone through pilot training myself and am a, um, a check right away from having uh, my own private pilot certificate, and the value of someone like me spending time in a Cessna running laps around an airfield on a bright sunny day stands in stark contrast to an hour in a simulator learning how to respond to emergency scenarios that builds muscle memory in preparation for an emergency scenario. Mr. Thress, you say that simulators can capture a pilot's performance data that can then be used to show the pilot how and where to improve. How prevalent is that technology today? And can you give us a quick example of how that works, how data points are captured, and what the presentation back to the pilot looks like? Uh, gladly. So um, very similar to most commercial airplanes have a, a FOQA system which measures the pilot's performance both with respect to uh, where he puts the airplane in the airspace. The simulators also capture control position inputs during different maneuvers. So um, uh, a good example is uh, an engine failure during takeoff. The most critical time for an engine failure is at a decision speed called V1. Um, and we, we train that for every, every pilot that we train. So if a pilot's struggling with the V1 cut, as we refer to it, uh, we can show him how he is manipulating the physical controls of the airplane versus a successful maneuver. Uh, and he can say, okay, I'm, I'm putting in the wrong rudder, or I'm putting in not enough rudder, or I'm putting in too much rudder uh, during the cut. Uh, so th there, that you could multiply that across uh, a whole variety of, of different maneuvers, uh, but that's the basics of how it works. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. And could an aspiring airline pilot learn any of that flying in a Cessna as I do on under ideal conditions? So, so training in the aircraft itself is limited to some what I would call marginal scenarios. So let's take that same engine failure as an example. 
So if you do an engine failure training in the airplane, instead of total loss of the thrust, the power is typically reduced to idle where the engine's still making 30 to 40% of its maximum thrust. So there's the first unrealism. The second one is for safety reasons, uh, the uh, engine power cannot be reduced until at least 500 feet above the ground. So you kind of miss the whole critical training element of uh, the, the engine failure occurring at the most critical point of V1. Thank you. Mr. Ambrosi, let's consider two theoretical aspiring airline pilots. One spends 1,500 hours flying in Class E or Class Echo airspace with zero simulator time. The other has completed 1,500 hours. 1,400 of those were spent in Class E airspace, but 100 of those were in a simulator environment of a regional jet flying in Class Bravo airspace in varying weather conditions and mechanical scenarios, receiving data-driven debriefs showing how they can improve their response to the scenarios. Which pilot do you think is better prepared to be an airline pilot? Well, sir, thank you for the question. I will point out that the current system allows for 100 hours of, of simulator training, just as, just as you, uh, uh, in the scenario that you, you point out. So which one, which one of those pilots, again, would be better prepared, do you believe? As long as that simulator training is has a curriculum to it where they're actually practicing that and they're not just sitting in a simulator or sitting at a desk or a laptop, then I would, I would agree with you that that scenario would be a better trained pilot. So we can agree that not all flight hours are created equally and that the quality of the time spent in the simulator, was, if it's quality time, is indeed time that is well spent. If it's quality time, but I will point out that there is no replacement for experience. I will tell you, I've been flying for over 25 years in the airline environment, and simulators are critical. I, I've spent more time in the simulator than anybody in this room. And we train specific things, engine failures, just like the, the gentleman said. However, I'm not paid to fly a simulator. I'm paid to fly people across the Atlantic to their destinations in Europe in a real environment where things come up that you're not expecting in, in real world, world conditions. So, Yes, there is a significant value to simulation time, but there's no replacement for those of us that operate in the, in the real world, world with passengers behind us. Thank you, Mr. Ambrosi. I'll now recognize the ranking member, uh, Mr. Cohen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Captain Ambrosi, do you think 15 hours is sufficient time for a uh, pilot to train in flight? Did you say 15 hours 1500. or 1,500 hours? 1,500. So if, if I may, the the we hear the 1500 hour rule a lot. So it's 1500 hours is a, is a basis, which is a number that's out there. There are, if you have an advanced academics, you can, all, you can drop down to 1000 hours, 1250 hours, 750 hours because of the recognition of, of military training. So the, there are plenty of pipelines and almost 50% almost of all the pilots that go to the airlines are coming through one of those other programs that recognize less than 1,500 hours. So it's not a direct 1,500 hour rule. I will also point out that under the current law, the 2010 bill, people can bring, uh, uh, proposals can come in front of the aircraft, uh, the act arc Air Carrier Training Review Committee, just like those did, and there can be credits. So all the proposals that are bringing on, on simulator time or anything else can go to the act arc and it can be recognized. They, there is a process in place. There is no legislative change required. Do you think it would be a good idea to maintain the current, current rules? Absolutely. Look, since 2010, F fatalities are down 99.8%. I mean, that's a number that nobody can play with statistically. Fatalities are down 99.8%. We haven't had a fatal accident. We are the safest in the world. Comparing ourselves to other places around the world that have lower training, do, do, do people in small communities deserve less safe service? No, we should be striving to improve safety, not just have some, some, some lower level of safety just because we've had a good 10-year period with, with no fatalities. Would you think it'd be a good idea to keep the current rule which we have and also add, say, 60 hours on a simulator in addition to the time you have in flight? I will point out that, that it's, let's say, 1,500 hours. 100 of that already today can be in a simulator. Right, but Very let's just say, let's say you take that out of that and you make the 1,500 being and, and, and less, 750 for the military, et cetera, be up in the air flying around on a pretty day, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and then add to it an additional 60 hours in a simulator. That's an addition to, not in lieu of. There would be nothing wrong with that, but I would say today's rule allows for simulator time that's not even being used. 
Right. The, most of that 100 hours is not being used today. So they could go ahead and use that 100 hours today. Thank you, sir. Mr. Is it Thres? Thres, I'm sorry. What would what you do you think the 1500 hours is 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 good or bad the rule we've got with the annotations that the captain yeah I, I think I would shy away from the 1500 hour rule making comment on that I think it's for the regulator to observe I'm just saying that uh, of the hours that typically go toward the 1500 a lot of them are at a, a very simple uh, unrealistic as uh, was discussed previously uh, not not. Uh, relevant to the commercial uh, airline uh, operating environment and that the simulator is much more valuable than flying around in a, in a blue sky day in a 172. Well, what about keeping the rule like it is and adding that you also have to do 60 hours in a simulator? Yeah, I, I have no objection to that. And I think that would add value and add richness and experience uh, and build safety for the, the aviation industry. Thank you, sir. Now let me ask the panel to refresh my recollection. I had some memory of an African-American pilot, and this goes to the lack of African-American opportunities in the air industry, but an African-American pilot who I think flew around the world solo, and he might have been from Miami, and he might have gotten some, you're familiar with it? Did he, did, is there a program that he got started or he was part of in Miami to try to get students there involved in the aviation industry, and how's that worked out? I think you're referring to Captain Barrington Irving. Yeah, that's um, it. It's a, it's a wonderful, if I, if I had a check for a million dollars, I think I would try and give it to what he is doing because he has showed people um, in communities that are similar to the community that he came from that there's room for him, there's room for them in aviation. Um, I think it's been a great success. He's moved this, he's now uh, got documentaries going and so it's been great on outreach, but he's also showing them how to get into the industry. Unfortunately, those high career barriers remain and so we need to follow up those great outreach efforts for things that actually give people funding to access this career we've woken them up to. Since Jay Bairdsford Tipton is not here to give you a million dollars, how would you recommend that the Congress, with its millions of dollars, utilize Mr. Irving and his program? We had all, all had a great start with the workforce grant programs. That's been really important. Those were oversubscribed on the maintenance side. Um, on the pilot side, that could be expanded to uh, a pay a little bit more for uh, to pilots that are trying to go through training and education and support some of that. So increasing that funding would be helpful. And we expect legislation, the Flight Education Access Act, that'll help uh, right size the gap between what you can get out there in student loans. They're capped today and the actual cost of flight training is inherently more expensive and there's about an $80,000 gulf. So if you come from a lower income family, you can't get across. And in fact, we have a very modest scholarship program uh, we give about four or $5,000 out a year, but we often hear from people that if it were not for that modest amount we gave them, they would have stopped the flight education, flight training part of their program. So it's clear we need to do more to give people education funding. Thank you. Could you share some of the information about Mr. Irving with my staff so we'll have refresh my recall and maybe we can contact him? We'd love to share information and make an introduction if you'd like. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Cohen. The chair now recognizes Mr. Bean for five minutes. I thought it was going to be a lot longer, Mr. Chairman, so thank you so much. And good morning, panelists. Good morning, uh, T&I subcommittee. What an honor to be with you and uh, for you all to be forward. Uh, Captain Ambrosi, you're a lot of times sitting up front at the plane. Sometimes you're sitting in the back. If you're sitting in the back of the plane, what scares you? What do you worry about if you're sitting in the back of the plane? Do you ever get concerned about anything? What should the public be concerned if they're sitting in the back of the plane? Maybe food poisoning? <laughs> no, I just, in all seriousness, uh, our airlines have great food. I'm not going to. Uh, look, it's about having well-trained pilots, flight attendants, mechanics, making sure that this industry is as safe as it is today. What I worry about is are the attacks by special interests to roll back or change regulations that have worked. Again, we're back to this is simple. 99.8% reduction of fatalities in the last 10 years since the 2010 FAA bill. That, that, it's easy. We don't have to talk about any other numbers besides that. Safety. Let's do things to enhance. Let's make it better. We're the gold standard of aviation. My first ever hearing in the short three months I've been in this position. Well, how, what are we going to do to make that even better? We should be talking about equivalent or rolling back. We should be, how do we make it better? There's been a series of you know, recent incidents. It's been in the news. Uh, I participated in an FAA safety panel. 
with those kind of things going on because of all the new in the system, why are we discussing potentially rolling back or, or decreasing a level of safety? 10 4. 10 4. No, thank you for uh, sharing that. I'm on several other committees. Uh, I'm on education and workforce, small business. You name, of course, all these committees meet at the same time, but you name the industry and everybody is suffering from lack of skilled workers in their industry. You name it, and so everybody. So we have to rethink how we are getting kids fired up about careers, whether they're a pilot or an auto mechanic or, more importantly today, an aircraft mechanic or somebody that can fix a simulator. So let's rethink it. The Pell Grant, I know, uh, Dr. DeVivo, you talked about changes to the Pell Grant more money is one thing, but is there anything we need to do? Pell Grant, it's now 50 years old. Is What do we need to change to the Pell Grant besides just adding money to it? That's a great question. So for most um, students from under-resourced communities, um, Pell is helpful, but it's all the expenses around going to school that are often not funded. So. Uh, if you're commuting, how do I get a bus pass? How do I afford a bus pass? How do I make sure I can afford my books? How do I make sure I can eat? Um, Vaughn students, uh, oftentimes, you know, six times over the last year, they experienced a shortfall in income, right? And it's often for things like rent and Wi-Fi and, and those kinds of expenses. And so Pell is terrific in that it helps support tuition and fees, uh, but it's those uh, expenses around I got you. That That's kind expensive. of growing up, though. You know, going to college is not just the classes, but it's learning that uh, you've got to do your homework and get no one's there to, to get you up. So what do we need to do? What if we were going to make if we were going to make over our education system and to uh, make a path? What would it look like? I'm, I know you have you have uh, programs to teach mechanics. Pilots, but, engineers. But you're a college. What about the kid that doesn't even go to college? How do we, and I'll, I'll throw this as a toss up to anybody. How do we reach? We're, we're not doing a good job or a good enough job to get kids, and I say kids, but just young people or anybody really fired up about different professions. What do we need to do? Anybody want to jump in? Uh, Brad Thresh, what say you? So uh, I'm really out of my swim line here, but uh, I, I would say that the culture uh, in America toward Education is focus, overly focused on the four-year degree, and I think we need to start early in high school and channel people and... Right, how do we do... Create, I, I agree with you. How do we... Do, I mean, do we have... You have to create a pathway. Career days? I mean, would it be industries? Would you take some kids to let them shadow some of your mechanics? Certainly, but I think the pathway's got to be very clear. So the pathway toward becoming a commercial airline pilot at Embry-Riddle is crystal clear, down to the hour. Yeah. That pathway toward becoming a windmill technician or an auto mechanic or a sim tech is not as clear. And it has to start early. It has to start in high school. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Captain, jump in. Yeah, I would just add that, that, that we understand, and, and as the Airline Pilots Association, we begin our wage it all the way down to middle schools. We do over 1,000 visits a year at middle schools. We're trying to expand to make our a more diverse workforce. Our pipeline is full because, as you said, it's very clear how to be there, but we need to get people inspired, minorities, women. My, my daughter is eight years old, and I want her to have opportunities that, that females 30 years ago when I was going through it didn't, didn't have. So it's about getting out there and doing that outreach. 10-4. My time's expired. I love the conversation, love the ideas and thoughts, and so uh, thank you for being a part of the uh, debate today. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bain. I always appreciate your enthusiasm, sir. And with that, we'd like to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Larson, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to enter in the record statements from the Coalition of Airline Pilots, the Southwest Airline Pilots Association, the Flight School Association of North America, and Captain Sully Sullenberger, um, all uh, supporting the preservation of the current 1,500-hour rule, in addition to uh, other comments they have. Without objections, so ordered. Thank you. Um, so first, uh, first question is for um, GAO and Heather Krauss. Uh, you mentioned on page 11 of your uh, report, uh, which I think, first off, the report does a good job of, of outlining the, the uh, phalanx of challenges <laughs> that we face uh, and then some, some solutions for it. But on page 11, discuss infrastructure constraints, by which you mean school infrastructure, facilities, ability to train students. 
and as well as the increasing demand from traditional aerospace and from emerging AAM industry. And I'm wondering if the GAO has done anything specifically about uh, a study on the AAM industry with regards to the opportunity, employment opportunities, but also um, the uh, the shortage or the the dearth of folks who um, can help that industry as well. Yeah, we we did some work um, looking at. Uh, the projected timelines at this stage for AAM and as part of that understanding some of the challenges that uh, the industry faces and so one of them is workforce challenges. Um, the skills, you know, we did explore with stakeholders the types of skills that are needed for that workforce of so things like increased understanding of electrification and power systems is one example. Um, but the standards haven't been set in terms of, and the skills are sort of still being developed or determined that are gonna be needed for those types of aircraft as those aircraft are being designed and certified. So that's, that's kind of driving what would be needed for, for better understanding what kind of workforce is needed. To start yeah, okay, thanks. And uh, um, not, to, um, not to be too obvious, but I'll be very obvious. Another reason why it maybe it is a good idea to increase the authorization levels for Section 625, because it's uh, clear from the amount of applications that come in, we're hardly meeting the demand right now. Yeah, from the the range of stakeholders we spoke with had some concerns about the funding levels. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, uh, Dr. De uh, DeVivo, just turning a little bit differently, um, what, what actions have you seen as most successful in keeping costs down for students or for helping students? Are you asking about one specific program or just in general about how to keep costs down? I'm asking you what actions have been most successful in keeping costs down for students? So I'm, I'm not sure I completely understand what you're asking in terms of, you mean as an institution? I'm not trying to be belligerent, I'm just, I'm, I'm just no, a, no, no, I'm just a simple trying to question understand. about what are the best opportunities, what are the best actions that uh, an easiest for students to, to use in order to keep their costs down for, for uh, aviation schools, in your experience? Yeah, so it, it, you know, it will vary by state, right? Some states are, um, you know, in addition to federal funding, um, whatever that state is doing in terms of helping to support <clears throat> that student. And I'm really limiting my comments to those from low socioeconomic backgrounds, right? So, um, you know, any prep that they can do before they get to a collegiate program, and, and we do everything from aviation maintenance training to engineering programs, right? So um, on the aviation maintenance training side, there's really um, the rules that just changed after 50 years in September helped us to put the general license in high schools, so that can help save money, right? So then you're only coming to us needing an airframe and a power plant. You know, PTEC programs, if you're familiar with federal funds that are administered to states, where you can work with a local high school so that a student gets 30 credits of high school and only needs 30 credits at the collegiate level has an associate's degree. We're doing that in avionics, aircraft electronics, and we find an industry partner. So it's the local high school, us, and in this case, AAR, right? Now you're only paying for 30 credits of, of, um, of collegiate uh, education. So those are a couple of different ways. This, you know, having a, more of the work, the prep work done, to the extent that we can in high schools certainly helps in that pathway. Um, the nice thing about aviation is you could be flying <laughs> from a young age, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you can't get certified, but you can at least be flying. Um, so when students come to us at 10th and 11th grade, I'll say, did you take a demo flight? You know, start to get a sense of what the career path looks like. You can start to build hours even before you get to us. Those are some of the options that really help lower the cost for families. Thanks, I appreciate that, and I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to ask some other questions other than the 1,500-hour rule. We're getting a good debate on that, and I think that's great. Uh, but the workforce development part of the FA bill title will be will be addressing much broader issues as well, and I want to be sure we get some other things on record. But I want to thank uh, Captain Brosey for being our, our witness and here today. Thanks. Thank you, Ranking Member Larson. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Nels for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Listen, we all understand that pilots undergo frequent and higher levels of testing most any other high stakes profession. Pilots who turn the age of 40 are required medical evaluations every six months, an EKG every 12 months, and performance tests every nine months. 
recurrent training and qualification programs approved by the FAA and regular flight test performance evaluations. Pilots over the age of 60 also undergo frequent similar assessments to verify their continued competence and flight skills. These assessments provide an evidence-based an evidence-based measure of a pilot's decision-making, reaction time, communication, and overall performance. And there is no better measure of the competencies required for safe and effective flight than simulator assessments regardless of age. In 2007, the FAA changed the age of pilots on large carriers from age 60 to 65. Back then, ALPA was against raising the age. They fought against it aggressively. Once it was passed into law and the age was raised to 65, ALPA reversed course and supported the decision to raise the age. Uh, Mr. Ambrosi, are you familiar with the name Captain John Prater? Yes, sir, former ALPA president. Okay, Mr. Prater was ALPA's president back in 2007 when the age limit was raised to 65. In a speech in 2010, Mr. Prater praised the decision to raise the age and said it has helped with the pilotage shortage. Mr. Ambrosi, are you familiar with his speech? I am not. Okay, it is my understanding his speech was on ELPA's website last year, and now it can no longer be found. Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask unanimous consent to have Mr. Prater's speech entered into the official record. Without objection, so ordered. For all my colleagues here today, I need to clarify one thing. The aviation industry, and we know it, is the safest in history, in aviation history today. And I think it's the remarkable work done by the FAA as well as the airline carriers. But understand this, regional carriers support raising the age from 65 to 67. Mr. Ambrosi, a part 125 carrier can haul 20 passengers. A part 135 carrier can haul 30 passengers. And some of these aircraft operated by the 125s and the 135 carriers can be as large as a 737, a 747, hell, even a 787. Is that correct? My understanding. Yeah, that is correct. Do you believe the 125 and 135 carriers are operating safely, yes or no? Sir, I don't represent those airlines. Folks, these carriers can hire pilots to fly past the age up to 70 years old. Do you think it's fair, and nobody in this room, do you think it's fair that the millionaires and the billionaires in this country are allowed to fly net jets and all these big private airlines. They got net jets, they're flying, having their good time on their private jets, right? And they get the most experienced pilots to fly. While average Americans don't, average Americans don't. Net jets in them, they're stealing these pilots from the, the part 121s. They're stealing their pilots at the age of 65 because you can't fly anymore for the part 131s. You can't fly for United and American once you turn 65. Net jets and all these private carriers, they just love it because they're just taking them. They got a guy with 25,000 hours in the cockpit. They love it. A sports team, folks, a sports team can fly a part 125 and a 135 like a basketball team. Boston may have to fly to Atlanta, the basketball team. Cleveland's gonna fly to New York, the playoffs are going on. These teams are worth billions of dollars, and yet they are confident that the guy in the cockpit could be up to 70 years old, even higher. The wealthy elites out of Hollywood flying these private jets, they can have a guy get in that cockpit and he could be 70 years old, but yet we're telling the major airliners, when you turn 65, you're out of here. Are part 125 and 135 pilots less safe than the part 121 pilots? Mr. Ambrosi, yes or no? Sir. You say yes or no. Are they safer than, are they less safe than the 121 pilots? And do you have data that would support it, yes or no? They operate in a different world. Folks, this is my point. Large airline liners are forced to retire at the age of 65 because of an arbitrary rule passed by Congress. The pilot age was put into place in 1959, 2007. They uh, overwhelmingly raised the age and the limit to 65. Let's, I, I tell you what, I asked the committee to support my bill, let experienced pilots fly, raising the age from 65 to 67. I highlighted the health and physical fitness requirements, they're the same. Let's show support for the regional airliners by raising the age 65 to 67. The regional airliners are asking for our help and it's the right thing to do. Miss Black, I will fight like hell to get this common sense approach and increase the age 65 to 67 in the FAA reauthorization. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Nels. The chair now recognizes Mr. Johnson for five minutes of, of questions.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, uh, you and the ranking member. And I want to thank the witnesses for appearing today and for your testimony. Since the Wright brothers first took flight on December 17th of 1903, the aviation industry has soared to heights that the Wright brothers could not have imagined. Aviation today is an essential component of America's global leadership and Congress must stay diligent in ensuring that the aviation industry continues to set the gold standard for the world, thus ensuring continued economic growth in trade, business, and tourism. And it is critical to understand that the changing American demographic requires that all sectors of the aviation industry reflect the diversity that will continue to emerge because without pipelines of opportunity aimed at currently underrepresented demographics, the shortage of workers in the aviation industry overall will be exacerbated. Uh, Captain Ambrosi, last month I introduced the Minorities in Aviation Education Act, which, if enacted, would take a critical step towards diversifying and growing the aviation industry workforce by creating a grant program geared towards strengthening the pipeline for the entry of more women, people of color, and individuals living in rural areas into the aviation industry. One of the largest vocational flight schools estimates that it costs $96,995 to become a pilot for those with no previous flight experience. When you consider that people of color, women, and those living outside of urban areas are historically less wealthy, which means that they lack the resources necessary to become pilots, licensed pilots. When you consider that fact, uh, it's no, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a, uh, uh, there's some pieces in the puzzle that uh, become clear. Can you elaborate on the financial and other challenges that many individuals, primarily minorities, face when trying to enter the aviation industry as pilots? And also, um, some airlines won't consider hiring a pilot who is not a college graduate. Is it your opinion that a college degree is a reasonable requirement for those seeking to become a commercial airline pilot? Thank you, sir, for the question. Um, first and foremost, I agree. The ex flight training has gotten so expensive, I don't think I'd be here today if, if I was going through the process today. And so I can completely understand how tough it is for, for folks of a, of, of a different demographic. It's essential that we support, provide student loans for flight training programs, establish grants and, and, and support building out aviation programs at historically black colleges and universities and, and other areas where, where minorities can be served increase funding for the federal development workforce grants and, and make sure that, that, that we're out there outreaching to, to women in aviation and, and we're doing, it's an all of the above approach. It's not just one or the other, we should be doing all of the above. And uh, what about the uh, requirement for college oh, degree? I apologize. So I, it's my understanding that most of the airlines have, have subsequently removed that when, it, and when a time when there was just an absolute surplus of pilots both in the civilian ranks and coming out of the military. It was very hard to get hired at the airlines when I was going through the process 25 years ago. It was a, a, a thing they added to it just to say, hey, okay, one more, one more item to add to the list of, of narrowing pilots down. But uh, I believe that most of the U.S. airlines have, have removed that requirement, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. DeVivo, your written testimony stated that 80 percent of your students are from underrepresented backgrounds, and most are first-generation Americans and first-generation college students. Also, 21% of your most recent incoming class are women. You also stated that 72% of your students worry about having enough money to pay for school, and 20% ran out of money six or more times in the past year. Can you speak further about the possible solutions that Congress can consider in the upcoming FAA reauthorization? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. And uh, they're an awesome population. Queens is the most diverse county in the country. And uh, we reflect all the amazing immigrants who have come to uh, this country. And uh, that's been true for all of our 90 year history. Uh, as I put in my testimony, you know, there are several um, federal grant programs, uh, so p doubling Pell is key to this. 
Um, and that's true for every student I serve, but many students across this country who could use greater support. Um, these are the neediest students um, that are served by Pell. Um, I'm also fortunate to be from a state that is, is quite generous in terms of its state support, so that is helpful. The state support is, is often key um, to helping students get through um, the program of their choice. Um, and then there are, there are other ways. Um, the Flight Education Access Act will specifically help flight students. Um, oftentimes our students don't qualify um, for the loans like Parent PLUS loans, which offer much better interest rates because either their parents don't have a credit background or their, um, or their, um, their credit scores are not good enough to get a, a loan. So this would actually help provide subsidized and unsubsidized loan rates at interest rates that are much better. And then they could qualify for income repayment, which would be for more affordable as well. Thank you, um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Johnson. for your indulgence. Yeah. Back. Not a problem. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I'd now like to recognize Mr. Stopper for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And um, to all the witnesses, thanks for your testimony. And we appreciate uh, uh, being able to say that uh, flying uh, the skies is the safest uh, form of transportation. I have the privilege of doing it at least twice a week. Uh, Mr. Ambrosi, can you speak a little more about some of the accessibility issues to careers in aviation that you have observed? Yeah, like I, like I like said previously, sir, uh, the cost has gotten to a point where I don't think I could be in this position today. So we need to address that, and we need to address bringing more people into this great profession. Being an airline pilot today, now that, that, that we're in a post-pandemic environment and we're bringing up pay and working conditions uh, to where they should be, this is a great time to be an airline pilot. We need to make sure that access is out there for everybody. So, uh, like I said, fe federal student loans, grants, let's make sure that we, we get out there and, and um, get the resources to historically uh, black colleges and universities and minority serving <coughs> institutions so that they can, they can get the resources they need to, to encourage our next generation of, of, of pilots, mechanics, flight attendants, everybody get, in, get involved in this, in this great profession. And a follow-up, would allowing the FAA certified commercial pilot and aircraft maintenance technician schools to qualify as an expense for existing 529 plans lower this barrier? I think that's a spectacular idea. I would, we would support that 100%. And I'm grateful to Congressman Collins for introducing the Aviation Workforce Development Act to help make aviation education more accessible and as a co-sponsor. I look forward to championing the bill across the finish line during the FAA reauthorization. Uh, Dr. DeVivo, in your testimony, you indicate that legislation like the National Center for the Advocacy of Aviation Act could help create greater awareness of the aviation sector, especially by young people. Mr. Carson and I plan to reintroduce the bill next week. Could you elaborate on how the NCAA could help with youth engagement? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the key ways that we found as part of the youth task force was there is no one place to get good information about um, how to get to a career in the industry. So let's say you go to Oshkosh and you get a EAA for Eagle Flight, right? And then what do you do? Right? If there were resources online that maybe connects you to your local Civil Air Patrol chapter or Women in Aviation chapter, and then that leads to a scouting badge, and then you take a certain set of courses in high school, and that leads you to collegiate and training pro technical training programs. Right, The pathway is, and it can be very mysterious, right? and the, if the National Center would actually help in terms of a website, that would create day in the life, um, videos about all the different careers, um, what the pathway looks like, what the pay looks like, how do you get there, how do you finance it, it would take all the mystery out of it for families. I agree with you. I think that the more we can uh, let the public and our youth know about the aviation careers and how awesome they can be uh, and how exceptional they are, I, I think we can help with that workforce issue. And I know that this committee in a bipartisan uh, fashion, as Mr. Johnson uh, stated earlier, we want to help you with that uh, and we are committed to doing that. You know, I appreciate the opportunity to work with my colleagues uh, to improve the workforce pipeline and inspire more people to work in the aviation industry during the FAA reauthorization. You know, but the truth of the matter is we must stop disincentivizing a whole generation of abled-bodied Americans from working. 
Now, nearly every industry is suffering from workforce shortage. We need to return to a society that values the dignity of work and rewards effort. Only then will we see the real changes we all desire. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Stauber. Uh, and now uh, for five minutes, Mr. Garcia. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you to all the uh, witnesses uh, this morning. Uh, my first question uh, is to Captain Ambrosi. Uh, as you stated in your testimony, the number of ATP certificates issued each year between 2017 and 2022 increased by more than 100%, which is great. Uh, but with the flight schools across the country uh, are running at maximum capacity, uh, first officers complete initial training and then have to wait for a Czech airman uh, to perform their initial operating experience. Uh, once online, the first officers are underutilized due to the imbalance in captains, first officers, and Czech airmen. These problems, in addition to the mass early retirement during the COVID-19 pandemic, contributed to the bottleneck in the training pipeline that hinders a carrier's ability to effectively utilize pilots. So my question is, what, in your opinion, what can Congress do to help enhance your training capacity and to eliminate the bottlenecks in the training pipeline? Well, sir, thank you for the question. Um, the, the system is working. The pandemic, the, to the retirement piece, many airlines did early out retirement packages because they didn't know the three rounds of payroll support program. And thank you very much to the Congress for, for supporting the, the aviation workforce. Many pilots retired. We're catching up on that wave because those retirements are, are down. So they were basically borrowing from the future and those retirements are down. So the retirements over the next two and three years will be significantly less than they would have been. So that's going to help us. The training backlog, it takes a long time to train a pilot at an airline. And that's a good thing because of the, the safety record we have. So we're getting caught up. All those people that were bumped down are now training back the other direction and the, and the airlines will be in a, in a far better place than they were. As far as the, at the regionals with the captains leaving and they have first officers. Um, it's reported that, that, that some of the regionals, the better uh, paying and working to condition airlines are, uh, they have classes full into the next year. They so the captains are leaving. They used to, captains used to stay in place largely and wait for a major partner and go to a legacy partner. The pay and working conditions have come up at the middle airlines so well that now these pilots are also jumping to those airlines and then maybe jumping again. So it's creating those, some of the numbers are inflated because they're making two stops on their way to, to an airline. So again, we're catching up on that. The regionals have stepped up their pay and benefits to try to keep some of those pilots there. Uh, and again, that training backlog is, is, is resolving itself. And what can Congress do, if anything? It's going to resolve itself. I don't, I don't think any action is required, sir. Other than, like we talked about, on the, on the getting more people of diverse backgrounds interested in aviation. The pipeline's full. Let's make that pipeline more diverse and, and have, a, have, a, have every pilot, have every demographic represented. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, and Ms. Black, uh, how are your member carriers planning to right-size staffing to ensure the effective utilization of the pilots that you have or hire? One part of your question, right size, what? Can you repeat that, please? To right side staffing to ensure the effective utilization of the pilots that you have uh, or that you'll be hiring in the near future. Okay, I wanna to speak to the broader situation that's happening. I agree that we do have a pronounced shortage of captains, but to put that in a proper perspective, we have a shortage of all pilots, but first officers can't fly without captains, and during the pandemic, they flew a lot less. Actually, the daisy train of upgrades and downgrades that we see at the major airlines are not happening at the regionals, uh, but we did lose a lot of our captains and captain-ready first officers. The one thing that will slow that down right now is raising the age uh, for retiring pilots so that it slows attrition from the majors. We did see more jumping around earlier after the pandemic. That has stabilized somewhat, um, going to the low-cost carriers, then to the main lines. Pay and benefits has in improved across the board. Um, but 
regional airlines are and will be the career entry portal for the industry. That's not new. Uh, larger airlines can offer a bigger airplane with greater revenue capacity and more advancement to bigger and bigger aircraft, just like that happens at the majors. We won't stop that attrition, but we need to better manage it. And retiring, the retirement age at 65, moving that to 67, gives us about 8,000 more pilots that will stabilize some of that attrition in the next two years. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garcia. And uh, for five minutes, I recognize Chairman Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Ms. Krause, thank you for being back. I think if you testify one more time, you get a free cup of coffee. I uh, appreciate you, you being here and always appreciate the inputs you provide to the, to the committee. Um, look, I'm not a math whiz, um, but I'm looking, at, I'm looking at numbers and I'm looking at some of the data that you've produced. And um, so, so if, I'm, if I'm understanding all this correctly, um, that, that um, FAA is, is predicting that the, the number of pilots holding an ATP, an airline transport uh, pilot certificate, to increase by about 30,000 over the next 20 years, which is a 16% increase, all right? So then, over the same period, uh, they're projected that passenger employments are forecast to grow um, an average of 4.9% a year, um, or a 98% increase over the same period of time. Um, U.S. mainland carrier fleets forecast to grow from uh, 3,132 to 5,532, uh, a growth of 3.8% per year, uh, which converts to a 76% increase. All right. So I'm going to say it again, not a math whiz, but I'm looking at 98% increase. I'm looking at a 78% increase in demand for pilots, 76% increase. In, uh, excuse me, passenger employments was the first one. Second one is airplanes, 76% um, yet. 16% increase in, uh, in ATPs or, or pilots. Um, am, I, am I missing anything? We have a pretty significant disconnect. Yeah, some of, the, um, some of the differences is a little bit in how the forecasts are done. And also, um, when, you're looking, when we've looked at FAA's activity forecasts, like the employment ones that you were mentioning, they have consistently been overestimated, so overestimating greater demand because they are unconstrained in that they don't take into consideration things like does this, is this growth impacted at all by things like airport capacity? And so there is, there is some difference there as well as, um, you know, the pilot supply numbers that are, are, you know, projecting off of historical and other data. So that, that explains it a bit in terms of the differences. Um, but, but safe to say that even if you were to include margins of error and others, that, that we've got a problem moving forward. I mean, I think, you know, this, this industry um, and the growth of this industry is really dependent on the growth of the workforce. So I think that, you know, that's something that's important to focus on. So then, so then when, you, when you add in the fact that, that we're looking at uh, advanced aviation systems, you, you, you've got uh, advanced urban mobility, um, even remote piloted vehicles, um, uh, that doesn't help, right? I mean, that just further exacerbates the, the challenges that we're looking at moving forward. That, that's exactly what we heard when we talked to folks about and a range of stakeholders about advanced air mobility and some of the challenges that they face, which is some of these same workforce challenges that the traditional aerospace sector faces. They will also face that in addition to new skills that these workers will need. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, DeVivo, in your testimony, you indicated that the single largest hurdle to becoming a pilot is, is the resources, and I, I wanna, Thank uh, Mr. Collins uh, jumping in as a freshman and, and, and working on solutions to this issue. He has legislation to help address this, and I certainly appreciate him jumping right in in the first few weeks and, and coming up with solutions. But um, how would expanding the use of, of simulator technologies um, uh, potentially affect the financial challenges? And, and I'm curious if you could just talk on the safety side as well, which is obviously really critical. Um, could you could you respond to that, please? Yeah, exactly, uh, absolutely. So, um, part of the reason why the task force recommended this is because um, simulator time is a lot less expensive than flight time. And if you um, are not flying consistently, I'm talking three times a week, it will cost you much more because you have to repeat the last thing because you're just not well. You know, you're <laughs> working on your. Um, this, this idea of being able to consistently fly is really important. If you were to expand the number of simulator hours that were uh, um, available, then students could be practicing 
at a much cheaper rate, which makes that flight hour in the, in the, in the, um, in the plane that much more efficient. So we were not trying to suggest a change at all in the number of hours to achieve certification, sure, sure. just the efficiency of getting to that certification and, and um, uh, not having to require so many hours in the plane. Thank you. Ms. Black, very quickly, um, do you think that your member companies would, uh, if we were to, to raise the simulator hours, do you think that you could actually improve safety? Should your member companies believe you could actually improve safety? Yes, thank you for the question. We, we, we don't think so, we know so. Um, it comes down to how that time is spent. You know, when we talk about having more or less, it's really important that we ask more of what. And when we're allowing our pilots to qualify primarily through hours-based pathways, we don't know well, what they're doing, uh, but, but, the, but what we can see that they're doing is flying in light aircraft in fair weather. We know exactly what they're doing in a simulated uh, program, and so that increases the level of safety substantially. And thank you, Ms. Black. Mr. Chairman, you're back. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Uh, and now for five minutes, I recognize Ms. Shulton. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today. Workforce development in the aviation and aerospace industries is a key priority of mine uh, in this year's FAA reauthorization. I appreciate the opportunity to hear from all of you about the challenges and also the opportunities in this sector. Gerald R. Ford International Airport, the, uh, one of the uh, major airports in my district, has a unique arrangement with the West Michigan Aviation Academy, a school that's located right on the grounds of the airport and focuses specifically on creating uh, graduates who can go on to work in this field. It's really remarkable. We invite all of you to come out uh, and visit it sometime. We're so proud of it. Getting more youth in the industry will be critical to maintaining our competitiveness in the years to come, as we've talked about. Uh, we talked about changing some of the culture around uh, education and training here. I recently introduced a bill that tracks the way, or changes the way the census tracks higher education from not only recognizing uh, two and four year college degrees, but certificate and training programs uh, like this one. My first question is uh, for Dr. DeVivio. Uh, can you please elaborate on your experience as chair of the Youth Access uh, to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force? And what recommendations specifically do you have for Congress uh, to take immediate action for implementation and, and guiding this through the implementation process? Yeah, so it was, it was an awesome two years working with uh, 21 members from trade associations, industry, educators, nonprofits, all doing really good work. And we knew we were not going to invent the next greatest program. It had already been invented. <laughs> it, the idea was how could we scale it. And so what we tried to do was identify, you know, the major barriers and then provide solutions. So the two biggest barriers are awareness and finances. Uh, especially to under-resourced uh, and underrepresented communities. And if they knew about the, res the opportunities, which are transformational, I can attest to that at my institution, that more people would pursue it, right? But because they don't have an uncle, brother, somebody in their family, in the industry, they don't know about it, right? So we tried to give, you know, both very actionable, you know, put more resources in libraries, all the way to, you know, could we have a National Aviation Scholarship Program? Right. I think the areas that um, FAA reauthorization could really help with was, um, you know, the conversation can't end with our task force or the women's board, which I hope you're familiar with as well. This idea that we need to keep the conversation going, but not just at the national level, but also to do it at the regional level as well. So we had proposed, you know, use the nine regions of the FAA, use the AVSA, the Aviation and Space Education Office, they have representatives in each district, put together industry, higher ed, training programs, nonprofits. Let's at least start to share resources, share students, yeah. you know, and reach boys and girls club scouting, get all of us in the room talking about how we serve our regions. Then have whoever, have a representative go to a national advisory council that would look at metrics of success and make sure that that information was always being fed back to the FAA. Yeah. Around finances, it's the Flight Education Access Act. It's about doubling Pell, those kind of things that will really help change the trajectory for 
uh, under-resourced and underrepresented communities. Yeah, thank you. That was uh, very insightful and thorough. Appreciate it. Um, I have a, a follow-up question for uh, Captain Ambrosino. Uh, earlier, we were talking about multiple ways to continue to uh, expand our workforce, and I wanted to ask you, do you think it's wise to raise the retirement age to 67? So, thank you for the question. Yes. Um, the European uh, regulators have studied this, and they have recommended against it. So the Europeans are, uh, have studied the, the decline with age and are against it. Uh, the current limit in ICAO internationally is 65. The difference last time when we were at 60 going to 65, ICAO was 65. So going to 65 instantly got you five more years of airline pilots. In today's world, that's not, that's not the same because going to 67 will result in every pilot that flies internationally outside the U.S. will have to retrain on domestic only equipment. The airlines will have to build schedules that result in those pilots only flying domestically. This is a major cost burden. Not only will it, it do that for the airlines and create a more headache for them, for pilots that choose to stay, you will also have the issue of taking training slots and a much needed training backlog for those pilots to train going down and then leave two years later, which is a slot that someone that could do the next several years for that company in that position. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sheldon. I appreciate that. I uh, now would like to just recognize myself for five minutes uh, and thank you all uh, for uh, testifying today. I know that we've covered uh, these topics uh, uh, ad nauseum uh, this uh, this afternoon. Is it afternoon yet? Uh, today, um, I, I've made uh, addressing the uh, aviation industry uh, workforce issues and overall workforce shortage. Uh, I've made the workforce development grants a, a principal priority uh, for me as we consider FAA reauthorization. I, in course, uh, in an effort to seek increased funding. What I'd like, I'd like to start uh, with you, Dr. DeVivo, and I know that you kind of taught, have spoken to this several times already, uh, but to, just to re-emphasize, uh, I, I know that you generally agree with uh, the, the, uh, the desire to increase funding to workforce development grants. Could you just speak a little bit more um, uh, as to the benefit uh, to advancing uh, uh, the workforce development and addressing uh, the shortage within that pipeline? Yeah, absolutely. So, and I will say that we, my institution was fortunate to get one of those grants on the pilot side, and we are actually doing uncrewed aerial systems work. So, um, remote pilot work, which is really exciting. You know, the issue is, is that 10 million is, is clearly not enough for the whole country, right? And um, we would really love to see um, that funded at, a, at a 50 million. At the same time, please help give the FAA the operational funding to oversee the implementation of those grants. Um, I think it was a bit of a challenge, and if we were to move from 10 million to 50 million, I think they would, they would need some more operational help. Sure. Uh, I, in my previous life as a uh, local elected official, um, we built an experiential hangar and training program uh, with, in partnership with the community college. The grant uh, became very, very critical. We know the value and we know the benefit. I, I represent a portion of uh, the state of New York uh, with smaller regional airports, in particular uh, uh, Ithaca and Binghamton, uh, New York, where uh, sadly we've seen, certainly because of uh, workforce issues and others, um, a decline in, 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 um, in both capacity and and, and who takes advantage of or makes use of uh, those particular airports. I've, in my short time on the subcommittee, um, I've become a, a, a bit more interested and, and focused on advanced air mobility, AM, uh, with the understanding that uh, the technology itself and the advancement uh, of AAM could provide greater access to those regional airports and perhaps, in fact, um, revitalize them and, and create uh, greater connectivity with larger airports. Ms. Krause, in your testimony, you talk a little bit uh, certainly about uh, 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 your involvement with industry stakeholders uh, in the AM space and specifically future constraints to expansion. Could you just uh, touch on those uh, constraints and perhaps how Congress might confront those uh, within the FAA reauthorization? Yeah, I mean, we heard a number of challenges when it comes to the development of the AAM industry. First and foremost is getting aircraft certified. Um, so that's something that the FAA has been working on. Um, that will help, you know, sort out some of the other challenges um, that certainly are faced, uh, including workforce, and you have a better sense of the type of skills that you may need for those workforce. Um, you know, other issue, issues that we've heard when we've done this work is just the developing, having the markets there to support it um, and, the, and the kind of marketability of the, of the technology. Um, 
so yeah, there's there's a number of things that are still because it is is still developing um, that that kind of start with the certification of the aircraft. Sure, and I thank you for that. And I just emphasize uh, AAM provides, I think, an opportunity to bring back to life some of uh, these uh, regional uh, airports uh, that, frankly, can provide really good connectivity. Uh, Captain Ambrosi, as I came in, you were uh, talking a little bit about um, uh, steps that we could take, certainly, uh, to expand access uh, um, uh, and, and, and enhance uh, access to pilot education courses, et cetera. Could you reemphasize uh, this concept of making use uh, uh, and qualifying expenses under the 529 savings plans, and perhaps that as a tool uh, might uh, break down some some financial barriers. And again, I, I recognize that we've touched on, on some of this already. Uh, yes, sir, thank you for the question. I, I, as I said previously, it's, I think it's an all of the above approach. So I think the 529 is a great idea. I think uh, federal student loans for, for flight training. You know, it, other professions have access to this to this to these loans. I don't know why our profession is, is any different. So we should we should certainly open the doors. As I said, uh, funding for historically black colleges, used, universities, uh, minority serving institutions, uh, and all of the above type approach. Let, this is a great, I say it all the time, but this is such a great profession. Let's figure out how to open the doors for, for everybody. The pipeline is full. We don't have a problem attracting people, but we need to attract everybody. This needs to be a, an all of the above approach. I appreciate that, and I think we, we generally all agree. Um, you know, this is an area and a space that, quite frankly, if we get this right, can really unlock uh, employment opportunities with good paying, solid jobs, long-term investment, uh, and uh, I just hope that we, we, we make it a priority in reauthorization uh, and that we focus on uh, breaking, breaking into communities that often don't have access uh, to what will be a tremendous, tremendous work opportunities. And with that, uh, my time has expired, and I'd like to recognize Mr. Allred for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I also have a, a small aviation uh, industry in my area. I represent Dallas, uh, where, of course, Southwest and American Airlines are headquartered, and we have uh, you know, major aviation uh, employers, and it's critically important for us. Uh, and as we talk about you know, dealing with uh, the pipeline issues and, and getting more folks into uh, the pipeline, as has been discussed today, and I think as you just discussed, Captain, it seems to me uh, the best way for us to do that is to throw open the doors and also to increase the diversity uh, of our pipelines, particularly for our pilots. Uh, to me, this is something I've made a focus of, of my time in Congress to try and um, introduce some of our talented youngsters uh, to this pathway. Uh, that also, of course, will help us bring more people into the profession, but also open uh, new avenues. Uh, and Dr. DeVivo, uh, we've heard a lot about how your students and other prospective pilots are having trouble paying for school and mm -hmm. run out of funds and, and can't qualify for loans. Uh, I'm working on legislation right now to, to increase uh, the caps on student loans for folks attending flight school. I wonder if you could discuss how that would help uh, to increase the diversity of the students uh, and the folks seeking uh, to get into this profession. Yeah, absolutely, thank you for the question. So many of our families can't qualify for a Parent PLUS loan because they either don't have the credit history or they don't have the credit score to qualify, which means they have to go to the alternative loan market where the interest rate is quite high. I have a female pilot, a black female pilot, graduated with $90,000 in alternative loan debt at a percentage rate of 18%. Um, that makes it hard to eat while you're trying to um, get your hours, right? So, so this idea of having um, you know, the loans uh, for subsidized or unsubsidized raise means that they would have a much more reasonable interest rate, but also they'd qualify for income-based repayment, so it would be affordable as they make their way to uh, an awesome career. Absolutely, I think that's very important uh, to note. And uh, Captain Ambrosi, I know workforce diversity is an area uh, where the Airline Pilots Association has been very engaged, and I wanna thank you uh, for that. Uh, and just wanted to know if you could add anything to what you just said in response to the last question around throwing open uh, the doors, particularly access to these loans, uh, and how you would see that benefiting in terms of creating a more diverse pipeline uh, for, for pilots. Uh, absolutely. Look, at the Airline Pilots Association, we pride ourselves on, on outreach, and it's not just about the people that are our members now, but the future generation embracing the next generation. We, we do over a thousand visits a year to everybody from middle schools to, to universities, 
Uh, we have, uh, we, put, we put ACE clubs at universities to try to increase the, the outreach to, to, to more folks from a more diverse background. Uh, and, again, and again, it's an all of the above type of approach. We get out there, get the message out there. It's, that's part of it is getting that message out there that yes, you can become an airline pilot. You can become a mechanic. You can become anything that you want to become. So we pride ourselves in getting out there and, and delivering that message. And, and it does help that, that now the entry level pays of, 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 of this job are getting better to where you can fund some of these student loans. Back when I came through, you know, it, you, the pay was so miserable that, that a student loan was a, was a burden that was very difficult. So fortunately, we've negotiated better pay and working conditions at, at, at most airlines, and, and the student loan process is, is essential. So whatever we can do to help at, our, at ALPA. So specifically, you would support increasing the caps on student loans? Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, sir. Um, my last minute here, President Malaku Black, uh, as you know, Congress took action in 2018 and the FAA reauthorization to create Section 625. I know we've had a lot of discussion about that today uh, to allow government and industry stakeholders to work together to encourage more Americans to pursue good paying careers in aviation. Um, beyond reauthorizing and increasing uh, the amount of money in the program, are there other improvements that you think we should make to it? Yes, thank you for the question. I think we're doing a great job on outreach, and I think the workforce development, the grants, have been very, very powerful in curriculum development and teacher development, and that's strengthening us. But we could go even further and allow that to help people use it as another tool to pay for education and training, uh, both for pilots and mechanics. And I also want to add a comment. We've talked a whole lot about the, the degree pathway, which is, remains really important, but it's also important to support students that are coming through uh, certificate programs, Part 141, highly structured training programs. There aren't enough of those today. Right now, uh, two-thirds of the pilots qualify uh, through hours-based qualification. Um, that's another way where we can inject more areas of support, but also higher structure for the pilots that are coming in. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you, sir. Um, I now recognize myself which I think is kind of weird to say. I've always thought that, but I guess I'm doing it. Um, and I appreciate my friends talk about diversity. My mama actually flew an airplane during the Second World War, and so I'm, I'm, and I'm an unrepentant mama's boy. And I like the fact that there are three women up here at this time, and I'd always thought that if, if it was now, mama would be flying me up here to D.C., but at the time, that was just, you know, after the war, it was, it just probably wasn't the coolest thing, uh, although I, I carry around a picture of her in her airplane and is very cool to me. And after she, uh, after she passed, she was actually put into uh, Knoxville College's Hall of Fame as a historically black college there in Knoxville where she taught. So very proud of my mama. Anyway, uh, Captain Ambrosi, uh, you stated that pilot training backlogs contributed to air travel disruptions last year. Um, can you explain this and do you expect similar problems in the future? Thank you for the question, sir. And I have a daughter who's eight, and I, I hope she gets into this, this profession as well. Uh, it's a great one. But I have a daughter who's 15 and rides horses. I wish she'd taken up motorcycles. It's cheaper and a lot safer to go uh, right ahead. If but my I daughter's watching, I'm going to ask her to take up motorcycles and not horses, because so, so, I understand where, what you're going. Yes, sir. But um, look, let's, let's make no mistake. Last summer, the airlines overscheduled. They, they had airplanes available. Uh, because of the pandemic and the training backlog and the fact that they had displaced so many pilots, uh, they had to be retrained. Uh, they had available airplanes. The passenger demand was there. They said, hey, let's, let's go to the nth degree to try to, to get these people where they want to go, and they overscheduled. Uh, we're getting caught up at, the, at the, 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 the big airlines have more pilots than they've ever had by thousands, thousands more than pre-pandemic levels. Wow. So... Uh, can so you I, don't expect that to be a, happen in the future, or is there a caveat, as we say? If I had a crystal ball, I'd buy a lottery ticket. But I would tell you that I think um, that's, that the ball's in their court. Uh, they have a lot more pilots, and they, they should be fine this summer. But the ball's in their court. If they decide to go, let's push it just that extra X percent to, to maximize revenue, then, then we could have a problem. But they're certainly in a better position this year than they were last summer. Yeah, I hate it when they push it when I'm trying to get back to Knoxville. Um, Ms. Black, GAO determined that the pilot supply grew from 2017 to 2022, but the regional airlines are struggling to attract and retain pilots. 
What's being done to encourage the employees to stay with these regional airlines? Thank you for the question. Um, I want to speak first to the, to the uh, comment that the supply of pilots has increased from 2017 to 2022. We hear that sometimes. That talks about certifications, and in fact, they have increased. Um, but what's being missed in that conversation is what happened and what may be contributing to that banner year that we're having. And we don't have to look too far back to see what that is. It was the pandemic. During that time, about 4,100 fewer pilots than we expected actually qualified. And so they're catching up. They're still catching up. We haven't quite gotten back to where we should be. But once you adjust for that, we're below average. So we are, uh, you know, beyond that, looking at about almost half of our workforce within the next 15 years will hit that hard stop at age 65. So everything that we do now um, matters. What we're doing to try and retain our workforce is not just increasing pay and quality of life, and sometimes that means moving bases a little bit closer, uh, hiring people in bases that may not be the most maximum efficiency, but it's what the pilots want. So we're trying to meet that, uh, flow programs and other things like that. But they can only go so far. What we need to do is make it easier and, and equally safe to get into this industry and lower those access barriers that are get, keeping so many people who could come in and keep us connected out of the industry today. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Krause, is there any evidence the Aviation Workforce Development Grant Program be successful? Sorry, sorry, what was the question? I said, is there any evidence the Aviation oh. Workforce Development Grant Program will be successful? Um, at this time, so the grant pe um, period is 18 months, so those uh, folks that received grants should be reporting to FA the outcomes and results of those uh, grants, and so we should know sometime this summer those will start coming in to see what, um, what came of those, those funds from those grants. Okay, what in industry-driven initiatives could be expanded or replicated to grow the workforce? I mean, there's a number of actions um, that, you know, when we have looked at the, what folks are doing to respond to supply have been things like raising pay, um, both at the regional and the mainline carriers. Um, you know, it, it is really a shared responsibility and a partnership across, you know, industry, schools, government, and so you see things like uh, um, airlines creating flight schools to you know support training, as well as the aviation maintenance workers supporting um, uh, work, or aviation maintenance workers. There's apprenticeship and, and other partnership programs between schools and industry to support the pipeline. Thank you. And I've run over 17 seconds. Um, this point, I recognize my dear friend from Washington D.C., Ms. Norton, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Dr. DeVivo, uh, in your testimony, you highlighted the need for outreach to diverse communities to address workforce challenges. As you may know, black Americans account for just 6.2% of aviation workforce and 2.6% of pilots and flight engineers. While the recruitment efforts of diverse candidates have increased in the past decade, you noted that diverse students may not be able to afford to pursue the secondary education necessary for these highly specialized jobs. Should additional types of financial aid be made available to help low-income students enter the aviation field? Yes, absolutely. One of the great ways to do that is by doubling Pell. Uh, Ms. Kraus, I have been told by pilots that one of the major barriers to pilot certification is a shortage of designated pilot examiners. Flight students who have completed the requisite education requirements still have to wait to display their knowledge in exams because there are not enough examiners to account for all the students. Does GAO have any statistics on recommendations related to designated pilot examiners and their impact on the current workforce challenges? We've certainly heard that as an issue, um, but we haven't looked at it specifically. We'd be happy to work with your office to get some additional information. I would very much appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Thress, uh, training costs are a major barrier in pilot recruitment. 
could utilizing flight simulators in more educational institutions decrease costs for students? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, the cost to operate a simulator is usually uh, significantly lower than operating an actual airplane. And simulators can also serve as a, uh, what we call a rehearsal mechanism so that time in the actual airplane is more valuable. Well, we certainly need to get on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Oh, yeah. The chair would recognize Mr. Collins for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the cost of training for commercial pilots is substantial, and that's why I introduced uh, H.R. 1818, the Aviation Workforce Development Act. This common sense bill will make education costs at FAA certified pilot and aircraft ma maintenance technical schools a qualified expense for 529 plans. And I want to thank uh, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Cohen for their co-leading and help uh, in this effort with me and the bipartisan group of 30 members and numerous stakeholders who have endorsed this legislation. Y'all, it's a simple bill. All we want to do is give aspiring aviators and aircraft mechanics the same tools to train for these vital careers as those seeking four-year degrees. Captain, I'm grateful for ALPA's support for this bill. And can you just specifically can you tell the committee how this policy will contribute to a steady supply of commercial pilots? Absolutely, sir. Thank you for your, your leadership. Uh, anything that can lower the barrier for entry is a good thing, all above the approach. So adding, adding this to the, to the suite of products that are, are things that we're doing to try to lower those barriers for entry is, is a good thing. Thank you. There, there's actually over 13 million people with a 529 savings plans. So. Uh, Ms. Black, I'm also grateful to have the support of the Regional Airline Association. The Aviation Workforce Development Act unites the aviation community, including industry, labor, education, and flight training associations. Can you tell us how HR 1818 will make pilot and mechanic training more accessible and therefore help the airlines meet the growing demand for air service? Well, I also thank you for your leadership on that and uh, the other programs. It's so crucial that we're, we're reaching out to more pilots, and I think that's one area where the industry and congressional stakeholders are successful. Where we're less successful is actually allowing people over the burden, and that often comes down to money. So programs like you uh, have offered that give grants and actually put money in, in hands of, of people who are either training or are getting trained are really critical. Um, it's also important that we give people uh, access to the best training and um, and making sure that the things that we're doing are not just focusing on the career path. In fact, most pilots, uh, the, the degree pathway, in fact, most pilots that uh, qualify newly already have um, college degrees. So everything we're doing needs to look not just at the very valuable degree pathway, but also at the other uh, certificated and accredited institutions that are providing training. Thank you, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. Next up, oh, is uh, Mr. Payne. He's recognized for five minutes. Oh, Mr. Chairman, I thought Mr. Carver Hall was. It's okay. Well, go ahead. Different. Not the next up. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's see. Since um, 2000, the passenger airline industry has consolidated significantly with eight main line passenger carrier mergers in the ninth is still pending. Over the same time period, there have been um, three outside events that had disproportionate impact on the airline industry. Uh, September 11th, the great COVID recession, the great recession in COVID. Uh, against that backdrop of these disruptions, people looking at career pathways could be uh, forgiven for choosing an industry that seemingly provides great, greater stability and isn't on the front line of layoffs and economic downturns. Uh, Ms. Fay, um, um, Malarkey, uh, Black. Ms. Black, how do you uh, help prospective employees 
employees feel confident in choosing a job in the aviation sector? I think that comes down to the health of the industry, um, and it's all interconnected. The health of pilot careers, and not just pilot careers, but the other individuals who lose their jobs and we don't have enough pilot, depends on a healthy industry. And so do the communities that uh, regional airlines exclusively, exclusively connect. And so I think we focus on a, a safe and a health and a strong um, environment for, for our airlines. We were extremely grateful for the leadership of this committee uh, and Congress in the payroll support program. It saved our workforce. And you also leaned in hard to make sure that regional airlines, which look a little bit different from the majors, were able to access it. And for that, I thank you. Thank you. Uh, the importance of a diverse workforce is not just a matter of equity, but also improves the overall operations of the aviation industry. Um, Captain Ambrosi, um, can you please share with us how recruiting a diverse uh, workforce improves the safety of airline operations? Yes, sir, thank you for the question. Having a, a, a diverse workforce is essential. Uh, we are doing, we have over a thousand visits a year to, from middle schools on up, trying to encourage the next generation of pilots to getting into this. This is a wonderful job, as I've said many, many times. It's a great profession. And, and federal loans, grants to, to, to uh, build aviation programs at historically black colleges and universities and other minority serving institutions. Uh, 529, I mean, it's, it's an all of the above type approach. So doing that will, will certainly help bolster our workforce moving forward. Thank you. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of necessity these days that uh, we look to diversify this workforce. Um, you know, we're running out of, of the normal people that have been able to get these jobs over decades. And uh, the people that are in this position to potentially move into that um, position look a little different than than the workforce of the past. So it's it's just necessity in numbers that uh, we diversify. And with that, I'll yield back. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Ambrosi, I wanna make sure I have a proper understanding of the kind of medical examinations that pilots go through. To my understanding, there's a routine medical examination every six months. There's an EKG every 12 months for pilots over 40. And of course, you've got the, the regular recurring training and qualifications regimen. Is that right? That's correct. So uh, commercial airline pilots are forced to retire today at 65. You can be older than that and be a 135 operator, right? That would be chartered jets, uh, corporate jets. Is my understanding on that right? It is the exact number of passengers you can carry. I, I, I'm not sure, but yes, in a general okay. nature. So it, do, we have a, do we have data based evidence that tells us that 135 operators between the ages of 65 and 67 are more dangerous? than 135 operators between the ages of say 60 and 65. Is there, is there, a, data, is there a data based evidentiary record for that? I'm not here to, to say who's dangerous. I'm, I'm, I can tell you that the Europeans have studied this extensively, mm -hmm. uh, raising the retirement age past 60 with medical and, and, and evidence and have said, no, it's not a good idea and they're recommending against it. So you've uh, you said the Europeans have studied this extensively and that you have knowledge of that research. So. Captain, do we know of what, what, uh, what data they used to draw the conclusion you said they've drawn? Sir, I'm certainly happy to have my team share with, uh, with your team the, the, the studies that, that they reference. Sure. I mean, are there any American? We have thousands of these uh, 135 operators between the ages of 65 and 67. If there was evidence that there was an adverse impact on safety, wouldn't we know that in this country? Would we need to look across the pond to be able to understand the safety environment? Look, there's right now airlines with hundreds of people in the back get much more scrutiny than what might be happening in general aviation and other sectors. So I can't speak to accident rates in general aviation, whatever. What I can tell you is in 121 airline operations, which I do, we've had a 99.8% reduction in accidents in the last 10 years and it's based on the current system, the current system is working. 
I will mention on top of the fact that the retirement age, those are the other hurdles which I've, I've previously addressed where pilots over the age of 65, the international standard is 65. Those pilots would no longer be allowed to fly internationally would cause a Oh, Captain Ambrose, you and I both know there are all kinds of instances in transportation elsewhere where America is able to lead the world. I don't think we want to give the Europeans a veto over what we view as a safe and efficient aviation system. So, Ms. Black, I'll turn to you. I in your testimony, I think you noted that in the next 15 years, 50% of pilots will be retiring. One number that I think I also heard was 17,000 retirements in the next nine years. What are the likelihood that those retirements would have an adverse impact on rural markets like those in my state? They will hurt rural markets first and worst, just as the retirements and the other attrition has hurt rural markets first and worst uh, under the existing pilot shortage. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention a couple of things about the safety record of older pilots. These pilots are not operating in a different world. They're operating in our country. They're flying over your schools, your churches, your synagogues. They're in our system and they're flying safety. Uh, they're flying safely. Canada and Japan have a retirement age that is higher than 65. And ICAO is actually looking at increasing the retirement age in Europe as well. So. Ms. Black, if the retirement age uh, for commercial airline pilots was moved from 65 to 67, uh, might that help improve rural air service? Yes, very specifically, it would alleviate the captain shortage that we have. And these are some of the most experienced pilots, and they are needed to develop the next generation. Ms. Black, is there, does the bulk of literature in this area suggest that pilots between the ages of 65 and 67 would have an adverse impact on safety? Absolutely not. Okay, uh, Mr. Ambrosi, turning again to you, I, I thought the chairman uh, in his opening comments uh, did a great job of talking about uh, ATP, and earlier you mentioned that the FAA already has the flexibility in law to develop some additional pathways uh, to an ATP. Uh, would, uh, that sounds great to me. Would you join me in encouraging the FAA to use the flexibilities they already have in law? Sir, to, to your previous question, and I'll jump right on. F, on no, I only have 14 seconds, sir. I got to get an answer. Okay. Would you encourage the FAA to use those authorities they have? They have? No one has given them a proposal. So bring a proposal and let the FAA take a look at it. All right, you're good. Thank you, sir. With that, my time has expired. We will look toward Mr. Carbajal. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Captain Ambrosi, there's a lot of noise regarding the current supply of pilots in the workforce. Uh, GAO testimony mentions the supply of pilots is expected to increase. From your perspective, do we have enough pilots in the workforce to meet the current and future demands, especially as we welcome new entrants into the airspace? Yes, sir. Uh, the pilot supply is good. There are, the pipeline is full. We have a training backlog. As in any pandemic-related industry, we're getting caught back up. Help is around the corner. Pilots are training as fast as they can. So we do need to get, as we said previously, keep outreach, get more people involved in this, more diverse backgrounds, but the pilot supply is good. If, with your indulgence, I'd like to reference a fact on FAR 135 accidents. There's been 79 accidents since 2010 with hundreds of fatalities, just to put that on the record. Thank you. I, uh, you know, I recently ran into one of my colleagues across the aisle, um, former General uh, Bergman, who's a pilot himself. And I was really uh, taken aback. He volunteered that he was adamantly against uh, changing the age for our pilots. And um, it, it just caught me off guard because I wasn't even discussing that issue with him. But I, I only mention that because I, he's somebody who uh, I respect greatly and uh, served in the Marine Corps as I did. And uh, again, he went to great lengths to let me know why he was uh, concerned with that proposal. Um, Mr. Tress and Captain Ambrosi, can you identify and describe any conditions, factors, or scenarios that flight simulators do not capture that real world flying does? Uh, there are certainly some scenarios and some uh, physiological effects that the simulator doesn't capture. So one would be the effects of Gs uh, so during a, uh, an unusual recovery uh, in the simulator, you would still only feel one G on your body, whereas in the airplane, you may feel four or five, which can be disconcerting if you're not accustomed to it. So that'd be the first thing that comes to mind. 
The second thing is we simulate rapid decompression and emergency descents, um, but we do that through oral cues and uh, the cues provided by the aircraft's enunciation system rather than your ears popping and the other effects of actual change in pressure. Those things are done in another simulator called an altitude chamber. Thank you. Captain? Uh, thank you, sir. In, in addition to the, the items Mr. Thress discussed, a simulator can't be programmed for everything. So there are real world situations. But let's point out that most obvious thing that a simulator can't do. Give you that I could perish if I don't do the right thing thing. Because a simulator, you can always get out, reset, and, and walk away, which you can't do in a real airplane in real airspace. Thank you. Um, Ms. Krause, your testimony cites that although women represented 47% of the total US workforce in 2021, only 17% of the pilot students are women. I, obviously, I think we can do a better job of encouraging women to join STEM careers. How can we do better, a better job of ensuring our aviation workforce is reflective of our nation's diversity, including women? You know, uh, the issue of diversity is really a shared responsibility with you know, the government, industry, and um, the schools. Uh, you know, I think there, as Dr. DeVivo referenced, you have a couple of task force reports out there with a number of recommendations to the Congress, to FAA, to industry. Um, important to kind of take a look at those, the different parties, and see, see what might be implemented. On the FAA side, they've shared with us that they plan to start looking through those recommendations, figure out how they might implement them, and then track them on their website. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. I thank uh, Captain Ambrosi for sharing his information regarding 135 operators, and I know we want a full and complete record, so I would just ask afterwards you follow up breaking down those incidents by pilots between the ages of 65 and 67, and that rate versus pilots who are younger. With that, let's go to Mr. Despacito of New York. Sir, you are recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, Long Island is a proud host of the N90 Tracon. It's uh, actually nestled in the, uh, the north center part of, uh, of my district. I visited there a couple weeks ago, met with uh, the individuals who uh, run that facility, and it was definitely eye-opening to the aviation industry. Um, but as we've discussed today, unfortunately, the nation's workforce challenges deeply have affected the aviation community. Um, and on the topic of the current and future challenges facing the aerospace workforce, uh, air traffic controllers play a vital role in ensuring flight safety and efficiency. There is an air traffic controller shortage uh, that has been overlooked, we believe, for far too long. And the number of air traffic controllers that have clocked enough training hours at N90 are dangerously low, and if left unaddressed, will be harmful to New Yorkers and obviously their passenger experience. So my questions are uh, for Dr. DeVivo. Uh, are there any regulatory barriers that have prevented timely training and certification for our much beloved air traffic controllers? Yeah, so thank you so much for that question. And we are a certified uh, a collegiate training institute as part of the FAA's program to work with institutions to offer air traffic control. And we are in New York, and they like to work with us because uh, our students want to come home. Right. Uh, so. Uh, and they will do a set of four courses and then get a recommendation from us if they graduate and pass those courses effectively and go on to training at Oklahoma City. Um, I know that N90, because I'm in New York too, is has been a bit of an issue. It is um, something that we are more than, than happy to assist with um, because of the fact that our students want to come back to New York. Um, you know, the JFK Tower is almost completely filled with Vaughn graduates. Um, and many of our students are at the TRACON as well. It's, um, it's a very complicated um, training spot, and it's hard to hold on to folks as well. So I, I, I don't know enough about exactly what their training program is from Oklahoma City to the N90, um, but I do think that there are, are options to help with that. And it's good to hear you say that they want to come home because I know that we're working hard to make sure that we keep uh, the 30 or so air traffic controllers that have uh, been asked by the FAA to move elsewhere uh, to stay at that facility. So that is, uh, I think that's what we all want for them to come home. Um, and obviously, has the, has the current workforce challenges, how, it is, how has it affected your institution? Right, so we've lost about 26% of our enrollment since the start of COVID. We were on this nice uptick as the demand increased. 
Uh, and COVID hit our families really hard. As you know, New York City was particularly hard hit by COVID. Our zip code was one of the hardest initially hit. And so our families whose average family income is anywhere between 34 and 42,000, um, they lost their jobs, they lost family members who died because of the coronavirus. And so education was not something that they were able to do. So we've had quite a few stopouts. But we are starting to see the, 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 the enrollment come back. The salaries certainly help in terms of encouraging uh, students to, to consider aviation and aerospace as a career path. Yeah, and so I guess to that point, have there been any changes that you've made at Vaughn to attract new students and to, to have that uptick once again? Yeah, so we really, really work hard to sell the return on investment, right? Okay. So we are talking a lot about a defined career pathway. That's why our students come to us, right? Because their students and their families want to know what's the job at the end of this? Um, when can I um, you know, start to see some income from my family? And you know, we're not just changing that student story, we're changing that whole family's trajectory. Uh, and so having the ability to talk about the demand, which thankfully the media covers for us, <laughs> has been hugely helpful in terms of attracting students to the programs. Great. Right. Well, I appreciate your work, and obviously, uh, if there's anything that I can do to help uh, keep our people home and make yeah. sure that they stay working and living in New York, which is obviously very often burdened with uh, some high taxes, we want to keep them there. So I appreciate your work. Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, and we now turn to the gentleman from California, Mr. Desaunier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Captain Ambergia, I want to give you a second to finish your thought. Uh, the Chairman, I agree with him about American exceptionalism and can-do spirit, but I also believe Americans can learn from others. You are finishing about uh, some of the things that Europeans are doing in terms of retirement age. Uh, thank you, sir. I, I appreciate that. I just wanted to point out that, you know, we're 121 operations are the safest they have ever been. And my team gave me some facts on, on other, other parts that had been referenced and just wanted to share that with, with the committee, but I'm happy to follow up with, with more detailed data for, for the committee. And we can always explain to the Europeans how well we do as yeah. well. We're happy yeah, to not, share. To follow up on the ICAO piece, because I, I did get cut off on that, was that with ICAO is not just going to change the rules because the U.S. says. That's just not how it works. They'll put it into a study. So if the Europeans say one thing and the U.S. says another, we know how this world works. It's not going to be, oh, the U.S. said this, so let's flip the switch. They're going to put it into a study, which could be, who knows, years. So just to, to clarify on that point. I appreciate that. And I, I really appreciate the, the chair and the leadership to have all of these thoughtful hearings. Uh, reauthorization is a wonderful opportunity to look at all that we've done successfully, but also changing times. And certainly this one with workforce development, uh, last hearing, I, I was able to, during my five minutes, to talk about air traffic controllers. In my experience, in the San Francisco Bay Area, retaining those folks and training them. Um, in my experience with uh, the near miss with Air Canada, now nine years ago, where it was because of humans properly trained and the continuous training that avoided that. So whether it was Captain Selleberger and the Miracle in the Hudson or that instance, or so many that we don't know, it's proper training and attracting people, but retaining them and training them. So um, I'm going to read you a quote from a mutual friend, Captain Inverge, and I want you to respond to it. Uh, quotes, airline industry lobbyists and some in Congress are still trying to cut pilot training in half to cheapen and quicken it. That is a dumb and dangerous idea with the recent shocking airline near misses in close calls. Now is absolutely not the time to cut corners. No one, no one would want their loved ones to board an airline or piloted by a crew not able to handle whatever challenges they will face." Unquote. So maybe you could respond to that. Uh, that's from a press release from uh, a friend, mutual friend, Ambassador Sully Sullenberger, and it, it, the quote from the headline on this is, uh, Ap Ambassador Sullenberger denounces attempts to cheapen pilot training. So in the context of what I just said about the importance of having, not just getting people to go in the field, but to continue to keep those high standards. So at that moment of decision, we have someone who is properly trained and continues to be trained at a minimum of the current standards so that we avoid these tragedies. 
Yes, sir. Well, I better be careful because no one knows better than Sully, right? So if commenting on, on his comments could, could, could get me in trouble, but I agree with him 100%. Uh, right now, we are at the safest point in history, but yet we are still seeing some of these incidents. This is the wrong time to consider changing rules, potentially rolling back safety regulations. It, now is the time to make sure pilots embrace technology, but as you said so well, sir, we're there, we're that last line of defense. So we embrace technology, but a well-trained, well-rested, qualified flight crew on the flight deck are that last line of defense when it, when it comes to safe operation of the airplane passengers crew. So thank you. And, and I understand the pressures on the industry. I've said this before. Um, investment money is very mobile globally. Uh, people expect a return on investment, but it doesn't serve that return on investment in the long term to risk safety. And these questions about these near misses, and I don't want to be Pollyannish about this. The FAA and we collectively have a great record, um, so I don't want to raise alarm, but they are clearly messages, are they not? Uh, that they are, these are things that we should do root canal, uh, root, root canal, Freudian slip, uh, root causes that really get to the human factors in particular. There's a lot of pressure to push people through, and people want to travel. That's a good thing. Yes, the, there is pressure on the system, right? We have a lot of new. It's not just pilots. We, we focus a lot on pilots here today, rightfully so, because um, we're the most forward-facing of, of the industry. But it's mechanics, flight attendants, gate personnel, people that work on the ramp, it's reservation agents, this whole system, air traffic control, everything has a lot of new because of the post-COVID environment. People left the industry, not just pilots. Now a lot of new people are getting into industry. So we need to redouble our efforts on safety, redouble our efforts to, to, to look at why those things are happening and work together, industry, FAA, labor, look together and say, hey, what are we doing? Do we need some more additional training? I apologize on the time. Thank you. I yield back, and if I hear from Captain Sullenberger, you can blame me. And the soft tap was just a gentle uh, notice. When you've got people as experienced as Captain Ambrosi and uh, the gentleman from California, you get an extra 15 or 30 seconds if you need it. So if you have, have another question. Yeah, so if you want to finish your thought, Captain, of course, that's fine. No, that's fine. I was, I was wrapping up anyway. I didn't, again, safety is, is what, why we're all here. Very good. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Are there any further questions from anyone on the subcommittee who may not have yet been recognized? Seeing none, that concludes our hearing. I want to thank each of our witnesses for your testimony. You did a good job. This is not the easiest thing in the world to do. A great job. I would ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until our witnesses have, a, have had an opportunity to respond to any questions they may have been asked um, uh, or submitted to them in writing without objection. That has been ordered. And then secondarily, I would ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days to allow members uh, to make additional comments or raise additional questions. Uh, we could also have the witnesses make additional comments if they so wish. Is there any objection? Seeing none, that is so ordered. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, this subcommittee stands adjourned.